Dedication of All the World by Charles M. Sheldon. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Adelde Pinoroles. Dedication of All the World. To Ambulance Company. This story, which was first read to my own Sunday evening congregation and afterwards published in the Christian Herald as a serial, is dedicated to the ambulance company number 347, which was composed almost entirely of students in Washburn College, Topeka, Kansas. They were all volunteers and were listed with the 87th Division in the Medical Corps. This ambulance company made a unique record in the training camp before going overseas, passing the entire time in training without a single case of discipline or venereal disease. In dedicating this simple tale to this company, it is the hope of the author, who is the pastor of many of the members, that the same enthusiasm and patriotism that sent them as volunteers into the army will send many of them into the service of reconstruction of all the world. They are the very material needed during the period of upbuilding to do the work of making a new and better world. Some of them are already student volunteers, pledged to go into all the world and make disciples. They have kept themselves as pure and fit as Sir Galahad for the great quest. The adventures of peace will be more fascinating and alluring than the adventures of war. This book is a challenge to them and to all the youth in America to volunteer in the greatest service to the world that has ever been offered to the soldiers of the cross. End of dedication. Chapter 1 of All the World by Charles Monroe Sheldon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Adelde Pinoroles. Chapter 1 Amos Thatcher, the old photographer of Bradford, was honestly perplexed on that memorable day when the town decked itself out with all the flags and buntings and welcome banners it could buy, borrow, or secure, when the boys came home and the whole town turned out to greet them. There are certain events in the history of towns as in that of individuals which are epochal and deserve to be so treated. Such an event had come to Bradford— when the ambulance company 241 had been entrained for its camp, there had been no banners, no bunting, no brass band, no decorated streets and office buildings. The boys had gone away in a rather quiet fashion. Fathers and mothers, sisters and sweethearts had come down to the train, and there had been abundant leave-taking after a fashion, but nothing exuberant or demonstrative. When the train finally pulled out, there was a cheer, and some waving handkerchiefs and hats, and hands reached up to the windows out of which the boys were leaning, and bundles and baskets of fruit and candy and lunches were caught out by smiling-faced lads, and the crowd had lingered round the station until the train was out of sight. And then it had scattered, very quietly and soberly, and eyes that had bravely and steadily looked into other eyes undimmed, now filled, and the step faltered in anticipatory thought of the unknown future for ambulance company number 241. But the homecoming, ah, that was a different story. Bradford put on all its holiday and convention clothes. It spread its colors lavishly to the breeze. There was not a store, an office, a house, or even a barn without its token of welcome. Main Street was a fluttering rainbow. The little depot, which had not been painted for a good many months, was almost covered up with the colors of the sky, the sunrise, and the starlight. And the tragedy of it all to Amos Thatcher was the plain fact that he could not be everywhere at once to get all the views he wanted. There was the main street and the post office and the courthouse and Dr. Grant's home. Gramp was the company captain, and he was coming back with decorations pinned on him by Clemenceau himself. And there was the depot and the incoming train and the churches and the G.A.R. and the mayor and city officials and the fire department and the procession which had formed and was even now extended all the way from the depot to the post office. To be sure, there were two other photographers in Bradford, but they were women— and Amos secretly sniffed at them and their outfit as altogether impossible and inadequate for the great occasion. He had flitted nervously all over town that morning, getting snapshots of nearly everything, but had finally come down to the depot to catch the boys at the exciting moment of their arrival. He planted his camera up against the end of the depot, put his black box with its plates down by it, and turning around as he rose, he knocked the hat off a man in the crowd. "'Why don't you?' Amos started to complain irritably and then, almost with comical rapidity, his own hat came off, and he dived down after the other man's. "'Dr. Ward, I beg your pardon. All my fault. Here.' He picked up the hat and handed it to the man, who took it with a smile that seemed to irradiate the atmosphere in a circle like a personal halo. 
"'It's all right. All right, Thatcher. I got in your way.' Amos Thatcher looked at Dr. Ward wistfully. "'That's fiction, doctor, but we understand you. Tell you what, while we're waiting, give me a group. You and Mrs. Ward and Esther. Where's Mary?' "'Down at the end of the end of the platform,' said the doctor. "'But I—' "'Don't refuse me, doctor. Think of it. Here I have loaded down with hydroquinone and sulfide of soda and carbonate and bromide of potassium and pyro at six dollars a pound and hypo and alum and acetic acid at a dollar and a quarter a gallon and metal at a hundred dollars a pound. Just think of that, doctor, and it used to be five dollars. And just think of all the pictures going to waste here today.' And Amos groaned as his eye took in the wealth of impossible chances on this day of Bradford's great celebration. "'You don't mind just this once, do you, doctor?' Amos pleaded. "'You have never given me a good chance at you, and here is Richard coming home with the Croix de Guerre, and all that, and I want Mary in it, too.' Dr. Ward smiled again, and returned Amos's pleading look with one that meant yielding affirmation. "'Mary is at the other end of the platform with the rest of the high school, but—' "'Oh, well, come, Sarah Esther, it's only one day out of a lifetime. Gave Amos his chance.' "'Out here!' cried Amos, eagerly pushing through the crowd to a sunny spot outside the circle around the depot. And the crowd turned with real interest and amusement at the sight of Dr. Ward, his wife, and their oldest daughter forming a picture for Thatcher. For in all the history of Bradford, so far, no one had ever known Dr. Ward to have his picture taken, far less to stand for a group with his wife and daughter. So the crowd was at a high tension of excitement as it viewed the unusual sight with almost as much interest as Amos himself, who— when he had succeeded in posing the doctor and Mrs. Ward and Esther as they wanted them, turned about to find every person at that end of the little depot standing in a half-circle, as if they were a real audience to a real show. Amos grinned at the sight, but turned his back on the crowd to give the doctor a direction. "'I can't get a good picture with your hat on, doctor. You will take it off, won't you? Just a little farther in, Miss Esther. There, that's better. Miss Ward, if you please, a trifle back. Just a trifle. Thank you.' Amos held up his hand, adjusted the cloth, put his head under it, and at that precise moment the engine whistle blew. "'They're coming, they're coming!' The whole crowd surged down to the track. Dr. Ward, dragged by Esther and Mrs. Ward, followed, and Amos emerged from the black cloth to find his picture slipping into the shouting, hurrahing mass of Bradford's best citizens in that moment of real life. Amos threw up his hands, then he grabbed all the implements of his profession he could hold, and followed the crowd to get whatever he could, as he groaned over the marvellous pictures and groups going to waste on every side. And truly no picture or series of pictures could do justice to the homecoming of the Ambulance Company 241. The people ran out in front of the engine and surrounded the trains on all sides. Old Jim Wilson, the engineer, pulled up and stopped before he was within a hundred feet of the depot platform, and climbed down out of his cap and joined the welcoming mob. There were so many scenes that an army of photographers, to say nothing of one Amos Thatcher, could not have got them. Men and women were crying and laughing and shouting and calling out the names of sons and brothers and husbands and lovers, crowding up on the steps of the coaches, trying to swarm into them, while the boys inside yelled to get out and Jim Wilson stood helplessly by the side of his engine, wiping the tears off his cheeks with an oily rag, and swearing under his choking breath that he would be another day late getting into Bayview, next station to Bradford. But when the boys finally succeeded in getting out of the coaches and into the arms of their respective fathers, mothers, wives, sisters, and lovers, the company formed for its place in the procession, for Bradford was not going to be cheated of that procession, which it had projected in its imagination almost from the very day when Ambulance Company 241 had left for its training camp. The company would much rather have gone straight home without any fuss but it good-naturedly understood the situation, and with more or less simulated protest consent to be lionized. They formed up in the place assigned by the marshal of the day, right behind the band, composed of high school students, boys and girls, proud of the honor and waltzing with excitement. The lines of citizens up the street through which the procession was to pass had fallen into the middle of the road in their eagerness to see the company, and were wondering at the delay, as all people at all processions always wonder but the delay was inexcusable, for it was caused by the one company ambulance which number 241 had been permitted to bring home as a trophy. This ambulance had a history, and all Bradford had more or less knowledge of it. But the thing itself was what Bradford wanted to see almost as much as the boys themselves. Bradford was proud of its two cannon in the courthouse square at the base of the soldiers' monument, cannon of an obsolete pattern captioned by the boys of 61. But the younger generation knew nothing of their history, and only an occasional veteran would stop as he slowly crossed the square and lay his trembling hand on the cold lip of the cannon's mouth 
and linger a moment, memory travelling back over the fifty years. But the ambulance of Company 241 represented a new type of war, with new and strange weapons and appliances that even high school boys and girls understood, and when, after considerable delay, the shell-shattered car was brought out and cranked up, all Bradford, within seeing distance of it, set up a cheer that was heard beyond the post-office and broke up the line of waiting delegations in the procession. The people who had been waiting impatiently there, mostly the older women and men who were not related to the company, broke from their places and surged down the street to the depot, and the marshal of the day, old Judge Grayson, in vain tried to reform the waiting lines. His horse, which was almost as old as himself, backed over the curb onto the sidewalk and threatened to march hind first through Deacon Chandler's grocery store. The judge had not been on a horse for a good many years, and he soon found he had all he could do to reform himself, to say nothing of the impatient lines of citizens who swarmed down to see the ambulance and followed its course up the main street in a tumultuous, hurrahing, and altogether undignified manner, old men and women walking and dancing in front of the car like boys and girls at a circus parade. There was enough of the famous ambulance to go on its own power, and Richard Ward, Dr. Ward's younger son, was at the steering wheel, which was minus the upper half of its circle. The whole car was battered up enough to satisfy the pride of every Bradford citizen. "'It sure has been to the war, all right,' one after another said, eyes glancing now at the boys, now at the dumb but not silent witness of the company's share in the greatest war of the world. The sight of that ambulance, after a while, acted on the crowd in a curious way. As the procession slowly climbed the grade of Main Street, the shouting and excitement and noise grew less and less. The car wheezed and rumbled. A great ragged rent right through the main body of the old covered sides revealed where a piece of shell had torn. It was a rent which the boys had tried to mend by tacking over it a piece of folded canvas cut out in the shape of the Red Cross. The top of the radiator had been shot away, and only one wheel had all its spokes left. The frame had been bent and twisted out of plumb, and the whole thing wobbled over the street in a drunken fashion that required a skill born of acquaintance with its antics to steer, so as to prevent it skating into the populace on one hand and backing down the street on the other. But as it rumbled along on that day memorable in Bradford annals, it seemed to be a thing of majestic and heroic build, its faded, rusted, misshapen form telling of the grim struggle over there. The mud of France was still clinging to its tires, and what was once the lifeblood of human beings stained the seats and the floor and even the sides of the wall within. No wonder that Bradford, by the time the company had come as far as the courthouse square, was quieter, almost as if it had begun to catch the real meaning of the story which the old ambulance had not only seen but made. For this is the story of the ambulance of Company 241, as told by Archie Nelson that night, to a crowd in the National Hotel lobby, after the reception was over and most of the boys had gone home to their own folks. Nelson was a lone sheep, and had no relatives in Bradford, and was staying at the hotel that night. At the request of the crowd, most of whom had heard the story before, but not at first hand, Archie gave the details, the crown standing and sitting around in a rap silence that embarrassed Archie, as he said he was not used to saying anything unless he had to yell louder than a six-inch bomb. "'You see, we were at Bella Wood, over the ridge west of the Borcheres, Dick and Bert Chandler and two or three others.' "'You were there, weren't you?' a voice interrupted, the only interruption Archie noticed. "'Well, of course, I'm telling the thing as an eyewitness would tell it,' Archie acknowledged as he continued. "'And it was pouring rain to beat Flanders, and that is pouring some. My hair is wet yet from Flanders. Well, we had driven the old car down the ridge, where we picked up three fellows, and were giving them first aid, when a bunch of botches jumped out of a clump of trees and began throwing hand grenades. We picked up the men we'd been working over, loaded them into the car— and Dick started her up the ridge, chug, 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 through the mud and over the holes, while Bert and I leaned up against the back end of the establishment so the fellows inside wouldn't slide out, and to give the old engine a heart, for she was beginning to have palpitation and compound fractures. While we were within twenty feet of the top of the ridge, when a machine gun on the woods let loose on our right, and the first volley took the half of Dick's steering wheel right off, and also the best part of his right hand. He went on steering with his left and all that was left of the wheel, when a grenade took the top of the hood off and clipped several spokes out of the front tire. And at that moment the old engine went dead on us, just as a company of negroes broke over the edge of the ridge, flinging grenades at the botches and singing, It's a long, long way to any breakfast. They quit singing long enough to yell a cheer for the Red Cross, and then swarmed down the ridge into the clump where the machine gun was fitting. Bert and I leaned as hard as we could against the old car, but we couldn't budge her. Then what happened but one of the fellows we had picked up and shoved into the machine seemed to come to life. At any rate, he backed up 
off the floor where he'd been lying, and as his feet hit the mud, he said, "'Excuse me, fellows, for butting in, as I don't belong to this company and was never introduced, but if there's nothing the matter with my legs if my eyes is gone, and it strikes me your old buggy lacks pep.' He leaned up against the old thing alongside Bert and me, his face streaming with blood and rain, and if you'll believe me, the old thing began to move. Not very far, for nothing less than a steam jack could have shoved her uphill through that mud. But just as she began to sag down again, what does that engine do but begin to thump again? Chug, chug, chug. With Dick sitting there, minus one hand, working the mixture with the other, and steering with his teeth or something. The fellow who had slid out to push fell down when the engine started with a jolt, and Bert stepped on him accidentally, pushing him deeper into the mud. We had leaned over to pick him up and put him back into the gin rickshaw, and had just got his head up to the one end of the cot, for one of the other fellows had slid off that onto the floor. One bang comes a shell and slams right through the barouche, carrying away the cot and killing one of the boys inside. But the engine kept it going and just wheezed over the ridge as a covey of shrapnel pattered around us and got Bert in the shoulder and me in the leg. As we began to slide downhill, we could hear the negroes yelling and singing, It's a long, long way to any breakfast, as they charged over the machine gun and captured the whole bunch of Bosch grenade slingers. After we got out of the hospital, Dick got the Croix de Guerre, and who should get the same at the close of the next day but Private Henry Munson of the 369th Infantry, formerly of the old New York 15th, a negro regiment. Munson was the first negro to get the Croix de Guerre, but a lot of them got it later. His company stood grinning in the pouring rain. It was still raining, while Munson received his honor, and when they broke ranks they were singing, It's a long, long way to any breakfast, but we's gwine to get some now. And you can be sure they did get some, the first bite, though, they had had for fourteen hours. Oh, yes, and I forgot to say that the fellow who lost his eyes but not his legs, and who helped push the buggy up that ridge, was a Marine by the name of Sam Rogers. He had gone over the slope with a handful of Marines just a few minutes before the 369th Infantry. Bert and I helped get him into the first base hospital, and as we laid him down he came to and began to sing a line of the Marine Band Chorus. If the Army and the Navy ever gaze on heaven's scenes, they will find the gates are guarded by United States Marines. We heard of Rogers before we left France. He's totally blind, but he's an expert stenographer and typewriter, with his good position in Kansas City, and he's one of the most jolly fellows you ever saw. He says he owes his life to Ambulance Company 241, and I guess he does, but maybe we owe ours the extra push he gave us over the ridge at Chateau Thierry. The next few days at Bradford were days of excitement and much visiting and talking. The boys declared they were more exhausted at the close of each day than they had ever been on the hardest field of battle. But the homecoming was so great an event that they reveled in the lionizing, and Bradford gave several days to it. The ambulance, with due ceremonies, was installed as a permanent trophy on one end of the platform of the city hall, with a neatly worded account of its adventures under a glass cover hung on one side, and the list of its heroes on the other. It was difficult for Bradford, in making out this list, to make any special note of individual heroes, and no attempt to do so seemed practical. As time went on, however, after the excitement of the first days from the welcome had subsided a little, a few persons emerged from the group and grew more distinct and outstanding than the rest. Among these was Richard Ward, Dr. Ward's son, the driver who had lost his right hand at the ridge of Chateau Thierry. Dick, as Nelson called him, and as he was known to every man in Ambulance Company 241, was an average American boy, one of thousands whom the Great War had developed into a grown-up, if not serious-minded man. The first day that Dr. Ward had an opportunity to study his son's face, he was reminded of one of John Oxenham's poems, in which a father is pictured as asking his son what he's seen out there. Dr. Ward silently sat facing Dick, but inwardly he was going over Oxenham's verses, face to face with reality. "'What did you see out there, my lad, that has set that look in your eyes? You went out a boy, you have come back a man, with strange new depths underneath your tan. What was it you saw out there, my lad, that has set such deeps in your eyes?' strange things and sad and wonderful things that i can scarce tell i have been in the sweep of the wreath or scythe with god and christ in hell i have seen christ doing christly deeds i have seen the devil at play i have gripped to the sod in the hand of god i have seen the godless pray i have seen the devil in petticoats whiling the souls of men i have seen great sinners do great deeds and turn to their sins again i have sped through the hells of fiery hail with fell red fury shod i have heard the whisper of a voice i have looked in the face of god You've a right to your deep high look, my lad. You've met God in the ways, and no man looks into his face, but he feels it all his days. You've a right to your deep high look, my lad, and we thank him for his grace. They were sitting in Dr. Ward's little study off the library room, and talking about Dick's plans for the future. I haven't any, Dad, Dick had answered in response to his father's direct question. What plan have you? 
You see, Dad, none of us has had much time to plan for careers. We have had so many careers in the old ambulance that we don't seem to care for anything common. How about the university? You haven't given up the thought of college? I don't know. Dick's reply was slow and hesitating. I was halfway through, you know. I don't feel much like starting in again. The old class is scattered. Some of it is in Alaska, and pieces of it in Jerusalem. And you know, Dad, I'm not like Albert. He always said he was going to graduate with the degree when the war was over, even if it lasted a hundred years. But Albert was a scholar. You know I never was. Yes, your brother took to books, Dr. Ward said calmly. His gaze traveled from his living son to a picture on the top of his writing desk, the picture of a young man in officer's uniform, with the aviation wings of silver across the breast, and by the side of the picture a framed letter. Dick, following his father's look, seemed surprised, as if seeing something for the first time. He started up and put out his hand, his left hand, to take the framed letter, and paused to throw a questioning request at his father, who was gazing at him thoughtfully. "'Yes, read it. Your mother put it up there this morning. You haven't seen it yet. Every word in it is just like Albert.' Dick, with a reverence he would never have exhibited to any stranger, took the letter and read it standing. It had been found on the body of his brother after he had met his death in an air duel and sent to Dr. Ward by Albert's company officers. Father of all, helper of the free, we pray with anxious hearts for all who fight on sea and land and in the air to guard our homes and liberty. Make clear the vision of our leaders and their counsels wise. Into thy care our ships and seamen we commend. Guard them from chance sown mines and all the dangers of this war at sea, and give them the victory. To men on watch give vigilance, to those below calm sleep. Make strong our soldiers' hearts and brace their nerves against the bursting shrapnel and the unseen fire that lays the next man low. In pity blind them from the sight of fallen comrades left upon the field. O God of love and pity, have compassion on the wounded. Make bearable their pain or send unconsciousness. To surgeons and dressers, give strength that knows no failing, and skill that suffers not from desperate haste. To tired men, give time to rest. Pity the poor beasts of service who suffer for man's wrong. O thou who makest human hearts the channel of thy answer to our prayers, let loose a flood of sympathy and help for children and their mothers who wander desolate and suffering, leaving wrecked homes and fields and gardens trodden under ruthless feet. With thee who sufferest more than all, may we with reverence thy burden share, for all are thine, and in thine image made. They too are thine who cause the wrong. O Father, may this war be mankind's last appeal to force. Grant from the stricken earth, sown with thy dead, an everlasting flower of peace shall spring, and all thy world become a garden, where the flower of Christ shall grow. And this we beg for our dear elder brother's sake, who gave himself for those he loved. Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Dick put the letter gently back by the side of the picture and went and sat down, and put his left arm up to his face. When he took it down and looked at his father, Dr. Ward was sitting there, with his rare smile, seeing the invisible. Albert would have gone into the ministry if he had come home. He talked it all over with me before he went away, and he would have made a rare minister. He certainly would, father, said Dick. Every man in his corps loved him. You haven't thought of the ministry, have you, Richard? his father suddenly asked. Or of foreign missions? Well, hardly, Dick answered with a hearty laugh. You know I was never cut out for the church, and besides there's Requa. You don't think her father would ever let anyone take her away from home? A strange look went over Dr. Ward's face. Then perhaps you will settle down here at home with Mother and me. You don't know how we have missed you, and Esther is getting married soon. If we could see you settled. The doctor's voice trembled with unusual feeling as he sat there opposite his only son, the Benjamin of his love, though Dick could not know all that his self-contained father felt. "'I don't know just what I can do best, Dad. We have both forgot this.' He held out the stump of his mutilated arm, and both father and son eyed it calmly. "'I'm interested in the chuck contrivance the Port Villay school made for me, Dad. The working prothesis, they called it. I showed it to you, but I don't take to it somehow. Some don't, you know. I feel as if I could do better to train my left hand to do the work of a right.' "'Where is it? In your room?' "'Bring it down and let me see it work. We haven't had time to look it over.' Dick went up to his room and came back in a few minutes with the chuck adjusted to his arm. It was a somewhat intricate device of steel rods and rod-high cords, not bearing the slightest resemblance to a hand or fingers, but more like some uncanny metal claw or series of claws which might have been invented by some inhabitant of Mars. 
The sight of it suggested at once a factory or a laboratory, or, as Dick said grimly, a bushel of dentist tools. "'I don't deny it's a mighty clever invention, Dad,' said Dick, roaming over the study, and flourishing the chuck up and down in a series of curves and twists, like some predatory old historic bird with a metallic beak. "'Just ask me to do something with it, and I'll show you how the prosthesis works.' Dr. Ward looked over his desk and finally picked up an old inkstand. "'Here, try your hand on this. I haven't been able to unscrew the top of this stand for years. See if you can do anything with it.' Dick put the inkstand down on the desk, adjusted a clamp of the chuck with his left hand. Then, without using the left arm or hand, he swung the chuck around, as if it were a crane attached to an engine, using the muscles of his upper right arm and shoulder, and began working on the cap of the inkstand to unscrew it. A moment of steady tension, and the cap began to turn slowly. The metal claw kept adjusting itself to the turns, and at the last revolution of the thread gasped the cap firmly, and the chuck swung over, holding out the unscrewed cap to Dr. Ward. "'There you are, sir,' said Dick, grinning. "'Show me something harder.' "'It's perfectly uncanny,' said the father, taking the cap out of the claw, which opened when his fingers had seized it. "'You're sure it won't bite?' "'I'm not sure what it will always do, and I get fascinated with it at times. But think of a thing like that holding out a rose to a girl, to wreck a dad, or taking off a hat to bow to a lady like this.' Dick picked up his father's hat off its accustomed place by the door, used the chuck to place it on his head, and then removed it with a series of grotesque gyrations that caused Dr. Ward to shout with laughter. But the next moment he was grave. "'The absence of the hand may determine your future work, lad. This contrivance is more for the factory or laboratory than the store or profession.' "'Yes. That's why I say I don't take to it very kindly. I can teach my left hand to run a typewriter and work the key shift with my foot. There is a contrivance all made for that. We saw a lot of fellows using it at Charleroi. But I don't know, Dad. I'm all at sea about my future. I'll have to do something and do it pretty quick, for Rico and I want to have a home as soon as possible.' Talking frankly about that part of his future, at least, that was very much determined on, Dick undid the complicated apparatus of the working prosthesis, and after a little more visit with his father, went up to his room to think over future plans. After Dick had gone upstairs, Dr. Ward shut the door of his study, and then he turned to his desk, picking up the cap of the old inkstand and turning it over and over between his strong brown hands. Then, after a few minutes, he reached up for and took down off the top of his writing desk, not the picture of Albert, his oldest son, who had not come home, but a smaller one, a postcard size of Richard, taken while he was in the training camp. This he placed on the desk in front of him and looked at it with lips that moved as if in a prayer of gratitude. And it was a gratitude that welled out of a heart that hungered for the younger son now home, after marvellous deliverance from tremendous dangers. "'I thank thee, my God,' the doctor's lips moved, "'for the lad thou hast spared to me. He will be a comfort to me here. He and Requa, I thank thee, God.' put the picture back in his place, opened the study door, and when Dick came down later and looked in, his father sat there with his accustomed serene look, working over his Sunday sermon. Dick smiled as he passed on and out of the house to Colin Requa. End of chapter 1 Recording by Adele Pinoroles Chapter 2 of All the World by Charles Monroe Sheldon This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Adele Pignoroles Chapter 2 Dick Ward and Requa Wendell had been engaged when the ambulance company 241 went away, and all during the trying days of their separation they had kept up their correspondence, and Dick was able to look straight ahead and thank the good God that he had been faithful to a pure love which the homecoming had intensified for each of them. Requa was proud of her hero, and Dick had reason to be proud of her absolute affection for Requa was an only daughter, and her father was jealous even of Dick. "'You couldn't have him, or rather he couldn't have you, only on condition that he doesn't take you away,' Rufus Randall had said to her one evening after Dick had gone. "'No danger,' Requa had said, as she kissed her father good night. "'What is Dick going to do?' he had asked. "'I don't know. He says he hasn't any plans. Only to get married,' Requa said, looking down. "'But he can't get married without some kind of business,' Requa's father had said. "'And Requa's father was the most practical businessman in Bradford.' "'I know,' Requa had said, somewhat faintly, "'for she was afraid of her father when he spoke with his business voice. "'So when Dick came in this morning, Requa asked, after they had exchanged lovers' pledges, "'Dick, dear, what are you going to do now you are through going to war?' "'I'm going to marry you and settle down,' answered Dick promptly. "'Yes, I know,' said Requa, blushing. 
but what are you going to do in the way of a business or profession? Requa had a little of her father's practical make-up. I wish someone would tell me, said Dick gravely. I'm all at sea about it. I don't want to start in with college, and I don't care for a lot of things the other fellows are going into. And here's this. He held up his right arm, while Requa looked at it, tears in her eyes. Suddenly Dick laughed. Do you know what Dad asked me this morning? Asked me if I ever thought of being a foreign missionary. But to his surprise, Requa did not laugh. You would make a good one. I would. Yes, you like people of all sorts. You're not afraid of any circumstances. You learn language easily. You adapt yourself to any sort of climate. You have perfect health. You are very persuasive. Go on, said Dick, as Requa paused. I never knew all my good qualities until you discovered them. There's a lot more I don't think of right now, but you have nearly all the qualifications. Would you go with me, Requa, to India, or Turkey, or Africa? Dick asked carelessly. You know I would go anywhere, but father would never consent. That settles it, then. Come, dear, help me to figure out my future. What do you think I ought to take up? Dentistry or a candy shop? The candy business strikes me. After all the shortage of sugar the folks at home have been bearing, they're just crazy for sweets. We can make our fortune in the candy business. The lovers talked the matter over, seriously and half-seriously, but when they said good-bye that forenoon, Dick went home as much at sea as ever concerning his future. When Sunday morning came, every able-bodied person in Bradford prepared to go to church. There were several reasons for this. One was the fact that during the war the five different churches in Bradford had merged into one community organization. Another reason for the general habit of church-going was Dr. Ward's preaching. It was simple, direct, persuasive, comforting, educational, and inspiring. The congregations of the five churches met in the largest building for worship and used the other buildings for various programs of social and community work. Two of the ministers had gradually found their places as community workers, and the other two, who were young men, had taken up special missionary service. Dr. Ward, by virtue of his long residence in Bradford, his influence in the community, and his rare gift as a preacher, by common consent, had continued as the fittest man of all to bring the Sunday message the people were eager and hungry to hear. When Dr. Roard rose to preach that morning, he must have felt the intense interest of the congregation held in his subject. In front of him sat scores of the boys who had been to the war, deprived of all church privileges, torn out of their three great common heritages, church, home, and school. Now, on the return, finding themselves hungry for the religious services some of them had not appreciated when they had them, eager to enjoy a genuine, real, heart-satisfying church service again. And Dr. Ward's subject gripped them. He had found at last, he said, the one great, all-compelling work needed for the world's new welfare, this new world which the great war had created, much of which those who had been fighting for it could not yet understand, because it was so strange and different from the world they knew when they marched away in freedom's name. But they would have time now to discover what this new world and what it needed. And among all its tremendous needs and its new demands for new and in many cases untried ways, there was nothing to compare with the Master's old command, Go ye into all the worlds, and make disciples of the nations. If the disciples in every age had only obeyed that command, there would have been no war. If only they had been willing to pay out for this missionary campaign one hundredth part of the money the war had cost, or a tithe as much as they had given to the Red Cross to heal war's wounds, the world by this time had been redeemed. But they must not dwell on that. The one great imperative call today was for volunteers to go into all the world and disciple all the nations, so that another great catastrophe caused by human greed and ambition and hate might never again fall upon the earth. How well he made his plea, Dr. Ward could not possibly know. All he did know was that a brooding silence was over all the room, that many a head was bowed, that lips were moving in prayer, that tears were on many faces that when the service closed after the benediction even, the people did not stir to rise until he himself had come down out of the pulpit, an event never before that had been known. Sunday was always a very busy day for Dr. Ward, as he had a preaching appointment in the afternoon at the hospital, and in the evening he was directing the Union Council meeting, composed mostly of the young people of Bradford. He was in this service until nine o'clock, and on going home, went, according to his regular habit, into his little study to jot down in his service book the important items of the day. He was still at work on this, which was his last act before he relaxed from the Sunday duties, when Dick appeared in the doorway. His father noted his hesitation, closed his service book, and said, Come in, Dick, I'm all through. 
Dick came in and sat down, a look on his face that his father had never seen. Both father and son had the same habit of coming directly to the subject. Dick said, without any preliminaries, "'Dad, your sermon this morning decided me. I've made up my mind to accept that commission to go into all the world. I don't feel fit, but I'm ready to be made so, and I want you to pray for me now, will you, Dad?' Dr. Ward did not know what to say. For almost the first time in his life he confronted a situation so entirely unexpected that he was not prepared for it. Dick sat there, totally ignorant of what was in his father's mind. It was the first time in his life that he had ever asked his dad to pray for him, and the experience he was having must have been something tremendous to force from him such a request. He waited in the moment of hesitation that brooded over his father, looking at him so earnestly and wistfully that Dr. Ward, in the tone and tumult of his feeling, was near to crying out with a number of questions. But swiftly it swept over his heart that here was his lad, the boy nearest his heart, the one he had followed through all his war experience with even more interest than that of Albert, his older son, and he had come in and asked for a prayer. His heart smote him as he recalled the fact that he knew very little of the religious life of this boy of his. There had been only brief glimpses now and then in his letters, as they had come at very irregular intervals, nothing very definite, and here he was now asking his own father to pray for him, and to pray that he might go on a service that might take him away somewhere on the other side of the world. It was the last thing that he had ever thought of in connection with Dick, but here he was asking for it, and as a direct result of his own father's appeal to the young life in his own parish. But the next moment he had risen, crossed over the little space between himself and Dick, kneeled by him, and begun to pray, with a tenderness and self-forgetfulness that surprised himself. When he had finished and slowly risen to go back to his accustomed seat at his desk, there were tears on Dick's face. He put up his hand to brush them away. "'Thank you, Dad. I needed it. You see, this has come to me suddenly. But I haven't any doubt about it. I know I ought to listen to the voice.' "'The voice?' "'Yes, the voice of God which spoke to me through you today. You remember you asked me here in this room if I had thought of being a missionary, and I replied I had never given it a thought. But now it all seems very clear. I have heard the voice of God.' Dr. Ward looked at his son with a feeling of awe. Dick, with a sudden yearning to know more of his son's inner life. Surely this is not the first time you have heard that voice. It must have sounded in your heart over there. Yes, Dad, we never talked of it much, but we did feel it. An English officer over a company assigned to work with ours was a poet. He wrote out his experiences while in Flanders before he joined us. I learned the voices, and they became a part of what I also felt. This is how they ran, as printed in the London Spectator and Dick recited softly, as if alone. "'We had forgotten you, O Christ, or very nearly. You did not seem to touch us very dearly. Of course we thought about you now and then, especially in any time of trouble. We knew that you were good in time of trouble, but we are very ordinary men. And all the while, in street or lane or byway, you walked among us, and we did not see. Your feet were bleeding as you walked our pavements. How did we miss your footprints on our pavements? Can there be other folks as blind as we?' Now we remember over here in Flanders. It isn't strange to think of you in Flanders. This hideous warfare seems to make things clear. We never thought about you much in England. We have no doubts. We know that you are here. You helped us pass the jests along the trenches. Wearing cold blood, we waited in the trenches. You touched its ripe baldry and made it fine. You stood beside us in our pain and weakness. We're glad to think you understood our weakness. Somehow it seems to help us not to whine. We think about you kneeling in the garden. Oh, God, the agony of that dread garden! We know you prayed for us upon the cross. If anything could make us glad to bear it, t'would be the knowledge that you will to bear it, pain death, the uttermost of human loss. Though we forgot you, you will not forget us. We feel so sure that you will not forget us. But stay with us until this dream is past, and so we ask for courage, strength, and pardon. Especially, I think, we ask for pardon, and that you'll stand beside us to the last." Dick said it all so simply, so simply, that it sounded more like a personal confession than a recitation, and his father understood. After a moment of silence, Dr. Ward said gently, "'Can you tell me anything more about your experience? I mean, your decision to go into all the world?' "'Only this,' said Dick, speaking with a cheerful directness that was entirely free of cant or morbid exaltation over a new and untried emotion. "'I feel as if I could do some good work over there in Mesopotamia or Palestine.' You know we were ordered into Palestine eight months before the war closed for the hospital and relief work, and some things I saw and learned there. He paused, in reminiscence of some things he had experienced, things not well to recite, and Dr. Ward understood his reticence. 
But the little that he had said roused a great interest in Dr. Ware to know more, for this was a new Dick, who had opened the door a little way into his inner life, hitherto concealed, as yet not fully comprehended even by himself. "'Tell me what you saw in Palestine to make you think of that as—' Dick answered quickly, interrupting, not at all like him, but with an earnest, impressive interest that swept over his face like a wave of intense recollection. One day outside the Jaffa Gate at Jerusalem, a company of refugees came up just as we were going out to our day's work. These people were of all ages, most of them Armenians, who had walked all the way from Damascus, because they had heard of the American relief at Jerusalem. As they came straggling up, I noticed one of the mothers. She couldn't have been more than eighteen years old, and she was carrying a dirty bundle of what I thought was rags wrapped about some fragments of fruit. But just as I was passing her, she fell down right in front of me. If I had taken one more step, my foot would have hit her body. We were all used to such sights, but I tell you, Dad, there was something so cruel about it all that I never got used to it. I stooped down and saw the girl had fainted for food. The boys pulled up, and I naturally held out a piece of bread. The girl came to, opened her eyes, snatched the bread, and then opened the bundle of dirty rags. Dad, there was a baby there, and the mother pressed the bread up against the child's mouth. I saw in the fellow's stall, in a minute, that it was dead. But that wasn't the worst. There was a spear of dry grass sticking out of one corner of the baby's mouth. Made me so sick I had to go out of the circle around that mother and her dead baby and sit down. Dad, I've seen some awful things on the battlefield that I can never talk about, but this beat all of them. And I wouldn't mention it, only it comes to me now as it didn't then, that those people over in the country where Christ used to walk and heal the sick and feed the hungry would be a good place for me to work. I believe I could do something over there to help restore the land to the people and give them the bread of life they need so much. And that isn't all, said Dick, after a moment. I got up from where I'd been sitting and came back to where the fellows were. The woman had been surrounded by some of her people, and they were all crying out for bed, when what does she do but break away from the crowd around her and make a stagger in my direction? I never felt so done up in my life, Dad. She could hardly drag her feet over the ground, but she came up holding out that dead baby. They tried to take it away, but she wouldn't let go, and she came right up to me and dropped it, rags and all, right in front of me, and said, America! America! Think of that, Dad. I made inquiry, or someone did, and learned this girl had been in a missionary school and began to learn English. And then in the massacre, her husband, one of the teachers, had been shot, and their house burned and herself tortured to make her reveal the hiding place of money. And she died the next day in the hospital where she was taken that morning. It didn't mean to me then at all what it means now, but I can see her right this minute falling down in the dirt over that bundle of legs, falling apart over her baby, and crying out, America, America! Why, Dad, I believe I would be a coward or something worse if I didn't volunteer as you said this morning we ought to do and bring America to these poor creatures. It looks like a big enough drug for a grown-up man. And Dick, to relieve his unusual feeling, got up to walk around, Dr. Ward eyeing him with growing wonder and interest. But when he finally came back and sat down, neither said a word for several minutes. Then Dick said, as if he had just thought of it, I think some of the others were coming round to see you tonight if it isn't too late. You know you used to keep Sunday nights for the open door, and we hadn't forgotten, only I wanted to see you before the others came. The others? Yes, there's Bert and Nelson and Connie Clayton and George Ryder and Holmes and Underwood and Blake and one or two more. We had been talking it all over this afternoon, but waited until you would have time to see it tonight. And that must be them now. End of chapter 2 Recording by Adele Pinoroles Chapter 3 of All the World by Charles Monroe Sheldon this LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Adele de Pignoroles. Chapter 3 The front doorbell rang, and Dr. Ward, quivering with rare excitement, stood up by his desk. For several years, indeed, from the beginning of his ministry in Bradford, he had established a custom of meeting any who had been touched by his preaching, or any who wished to see him on the religious life, in his little study in the parsonage after the Sunday evening service. He called this the open door. It had become as well known and established as any religious or social service of the church, and into the quiet of this little room, after the busy and sometimes exciting day, in the course of the years had come many perplexed and repentant souls, most of whom had gone out of the little room with happy tears on their faces and a song of deliverance in their hearts. Mrs. Ward had gone to the door, and there came in a group of young men. There were so many of them they filled the study up full. Dr. Ward was overcome, but he had only just begun to express his welcome when Bert Chandler said, speaking in his abrupt manner, "'Dr. Ward, 
We know it's late, and we would have come earlier, but the chaplain came in on nine-thirty, and we hadn't seen him for six months and thought he was dead. We brought him along. He wanted to come when he found out what we were coming for. Chaplain Hunter, Dr. Ward. But Dick sprang forward and threw his arm about a man who had been the last to enter the room, crying out in a tone of delight, "'Oh, Chaplain, and you are alive!' "'Very much so, Dick,' said Chaplain Hunter, hugging him with both arms, and laughing and crying as Dr. Ward advanced through the group to meet him. "'Hunter!' he said, finally getting hold of one of the chaplain's hand. "'Of course I know you. Welcome here. Welcome. And to think you should be here to welcome, Dad. Why didn't you fellows tell me?' Dick turned to the group with a fiery gesture of arm and hand. Bert Chandler answered with his usual brevity. We didn't know it ourselves until the chaplain walked in on us. It's like a story out of Maupassant. Or life, said Chaplain Hunter, his eye glistening as he glanced at his own boys of Company 241. Tell us. No, I came here to listen to a greater adventure than my own. "'Dr. Ward, I don't want to obtrude my little escapes and adventures "'since I went down on that last transport that was torpedoed in the Mediterranean. "'There is going to be plenty of time to tell it.' "'But, Dr. Ward, we haven't seen the chaplain since—since since we heard of his death in Africa. "'It's like a miracle to see him here,' said Underwood, "'who had been one of Dr. Ward's chorus before the war, "'as well as president of his young people's society and an enthusiastic Sunday school teacher. "'You ought to hear him tell about getting torpedoed. We never had any of that.' and Underwood spoke with a tone of regret that sent the whole room into a ward. "'Yes, give us that now,' Dr. Ward said earnestly, bustling about, Dick and Bert helping to seat the visitors. "'We have all the future before us for the thing that brought you here tonight. Give us your story, Hunter.' Chaplain Willis Hunter, a man of thirty-five, former pastor of the church in Bayview, next town to Bradford, glanced affectionately around the circle of his boys and quietly began. "'Dr. Ward, I can't tell you what a joy it is to me to be home again.' I'd been in Bayview only a short time when the war broke out, and never had the pleasure of meeting you, but your son, Dick, often mentioned you, said the doctor with a smile, the kind that radiated through the room. It seemed to him as if all of life in that little room thrilled with adventure, as indeed it did. He saved my life. Dad, don't you remember I wrote? I have the floor, interrupted Hunter, blushing through his tan as if he were a girl. Let me get this torpedo wing off my mind, and then we'll get at the real business of the evening. "'For I feel, sir, after what the boys have told me of your sermon this morning, "'that we are on the eve of one of the greatest adventures this country or the world will ever know. "'Just a word. "'I went out with the first bunch of chaplains that sailed in 1917, "'got in touch with Company 241 in France, "'and was on my way six months ago to Syria "'with a transport containing YMCA secretaries, missionaries, and chaplains "'to assist in the Palestine relief. "'We were near the end of our trip through the Mediterranean.' Saturday night I went to bed about midnight, after an evening on deck that was one of the most beautiful I ever saw on the water. The moon was full, the ocean like a sea of glass. It was to be our last night on the boat, and somehow almost everyone seemed to think the danger was over. We were in plain sight of a lighthouse flashing on the coast, and its welcome, or something, instilled a false sense of security. The only precaution I took was to sleep fully dressed except for shoes, coat, and hat. On the way over, I heard the commander growling away to the effect that the ship stood no show anyway, for she had thirteen ministers aboard. Apparently the hoodoo worked, for I had been asleep less than an hour when the first torpedo struck. There was no loud explosion, just a dull, heavy thud that shook the boat from stem to stern. No one needed to tell us what had happened. When you ask me what I did, my answer is, I grabbed my family pictures and ran. As a matter of fact, there is little more to the program than that. I switched on the light, awoke my roommate, "'jumped into my tall boots, without lacing, "'pulled on sweater, coat, overcoat, life preserver, and hat, "'grabbed the articles mentioned, and ran as aforesaid. "'Needless to say, nerves were a trifle taut, "'and a bit of humor which flashed across my mind, "'tearing up the back stairway sixty miles a minute, "'helped a lot to save the situation. "'I happened to think that I might stumble on those flopping shoelaces, "'and the answering thought was, "'It will have to be a lively shoelace to get ahead of these boots "'for the next minute or two. The lifeboat was in the water four minutes after the explosion, with the stern of the steamer already half under. We were the first boat away on our side, and I think the first of either side. The steamer disappeared in just thirteen minutes after the first explosion. I shall certainly never forget that sight. She settled stern first, the prow finally coming entirely out of the water and silhouetted against the full moon. Finally, as the water reached the boiler, there came a terrific explosion with broker in the middle, and she sank like a shot. Conditions couldn't have been better, because it was as light a day and perfectly calm. 
We were in the boats only about twenty minutes when we disembarked on the deck of an English destroyer. They said she was an old type boat, but old or new, believe me, she was the best-looking boat I ever saw. The most impressive moment I ever had was when he lined up on deck and our leader called the roll. We were pretty sure everyone was there, but not positive, and when the last man answered, Here, the crowd cheered their heads off, and we responded standing at attention and sang the doxology, and God save the king. I saved one complete outfit of clothing, overcoat, hat, gloves, my old gray sweater, both family pictures, camera, and razor. Everything else was lost, but somehow or other things didn't seem to amount to much after I once got my feet on the land. And that's all. Only somehow the report got out that I was lost, with a number of others, and my unit was switched from Beirut to Cape Town on the new Zulu mission work so suddenly that no word of my being all right ever reached the boys in France, and I thought I could give them a little surprise on my way to Bayview from New York. And here I am, thankful to the good God, after plenty of adventures in Africa that can wait, for I want to know of the new adventure we are going into. And Chaplain Hunter looked around the circle of earnest faces with a gleam in his eye that reminded Dick of the look he gave him when he went out that night into no man's land and brought him in safely back to the company. A silence fell over the circle. It had listened in tense mood when the chaplain was relating his adventure, but now the object of their visit to the open door seemed to come at once into prominence. This group of young men had lived in the atmosphere of exciting and changing events so long and continuously that every one present had come home with the thought of being a part of the commonplaces of Bradford and its daily routine, getting into business, marrying, having a home, and settling down. But Dr. Ward's sermon had stirred them like another call to the colors. How was the world to be saved, after all, without saviors? And the heroic note had been struck in his sermon with a power that the preacher did not know himself. He looked around the group now and was almost astonished at the sight of those present. He had known these boys in his parish since they were little fellows in the Sunday school. Now here they were, tanned, muscular, serious-eyed, ready to grapple with big things, feeling the stir of life, eager for its struggle. Almost before a question had been asked, the room seemed to be electric with prayer. They had all kneeled when Dr. Ward went to his knees. His prayer was an outpouring for wisdom, guidance, strength, revealing, power. The chaplain followed, and in his first sentence Dr. Ward understood something of the secret of the chaplain's influence over his boys. He said, Father of us all, we are not only in the hollow of thy hand, but in the bend of thine arm. And then with beseeching power he seemed to break open the very gates of the other world, and reveal the greatness of the common purpose that had brought them into that little room to consult together. The boys all offered short prayers, simple, direct, personal, a revelation to Dr. Ward of spiritual feeling. And it was noticeable in all this there was no straining for effect, no praying to others, but each voice seemed to be a personal, direct appeal for individual wisdom and strength. Dr. Ward was wise in his counsel. We have not come, I am sure, to propose any definite fixed plan tonight. I understand the main purpose of every one of you is to enter upon the great adventure of world conquest in obedience to the Master's command to go into all the world. That determination is so serious, so vital, so full of meaning to you all, that I am sure we shall have to meet many times and plan very deeply and carefully, if we carry out the command as the Master wishes. They were all so greatly interested that they remained in conference until after midnight. The chaplain's face glowed with enthusiasm. As the group finally went out, the chaplain's last word to Dr. Ward lingered in every heart. Dr. Ward, we have just come out of a great world adventure. But I believe we are now proposing to go into another so much greater that no man can measure its dynamic or weigh its dimensions. When the doctor had shut the door and had come back into his study, Dick was still there, standing by his father's desk. And it was at that moment that Dr. Ward thought of one question he had been several times on the point of asking his son when he first came to him that evening after declaring his purpose. He put the question now with the usual characteristic family frankness. Dick, lad, how about Requa? Have you thought of her? Will she go with you into all the world? Dick turned at the question and disclosed a startled look at his father. It was several moments before he answered. Then he answered slowly. Father, I had forgotten Requa. Dick repeated the words as he stood there. I never thought of Requa, and then answered, But I'll have to think of her now. Her father will never let her go. How do you know he won't? She said so. But Randall will not oppose her going if her happiness is in question. But suppose it's a knowledge of his happiness. 
Dick asked, with more shrewd knowledge of Requa's father than Dr. Ward supposed he possessed. "'I don't know, lad. You will have to go and see him.' Dick had started to go out of the study. He stopped at the door, and said slowly, "'Dad, do you know, I'm afraid of Requa's father. I never was afraid of the Germans, and I know you don't believe I'm a coward, but I would rather go over the ridge at Chateau Thierry any time than face him and ask him to do a thing I know he doesn't want to do.' Dr. Ward laughed. "'Is it as bad as all that?' "'Go to, my son. Does Requa belong to him more than to you?' "'She belongs to me. We belong to each other,' said Dick doggedly. "'But all the same, I'm afraid. How could I forget Requa? How could I?' He went up to his room asking the question, and in addition to it, the other, the one he dreaded to ask, "'What was Requa's father's say?' He smiled grimly to himself as he sat there in the dark, for he had not turned on his light, wondering what Requa's father would say, how he would act what Rekka would do if her father refused to give his consent. And the longer he thought of it, the more he feared the outcome. End of chapter 3while Dick sat in his room debating the chances of his choice coming in conflict with his love of the dearest girl in the world, Dr. Ward was having another experience at the close of this notable day. His daughter Esther had come in with her mother. Mrs. Ward and her daughter had been in the library during the conference in the study, and Esther had lingered on the porch with Bert Chandler after the rest of the young men had gone. Dr. Ward saw at once that there was something of great moment between mother and daughter, but the war had filled all of life so full of the exciting and unexpected that any event had to be very extraordinary to arouse a thrill in either heart or head. "'It's the last thing in the world I ever expected,' the mother was saying as she came into the room. "'I never dreamed of it,' the girl was answering. The color on her cheeks was vivid, and her eyes glowed with great animation. "'Esther tells me Bert is determined to go,' Mrs. Ward said, as she looked from daughter to husband." "'So far it seems to me he has been rather determined to stay,' the doctor whimsically remarked as he looked at the clock. "'Father!' Esther exclaimed as she laughed at his banter. "'You must know what Mother means.' "'Yes. It's what you have been going over here to-night.' Mrs. Ward spoke before the doctor could reply to Esther. "'After all we had planned, don't you see, we are going to lose both of our children, and we had so made up our minds that after this dreadful separation, and uncertainty, and loss—' Mrs. Ward's look rested on Albert's picture on his father's desk. It did seem as if we might have been allowed to comfort us those who were spared to us. But I will not complain, John, only my spirit is like the mother's in Padriac Pierce's lament. You remember, John, the mother who lost her two sons at the Battle of the Marne, the second battle. I do not grudge them, Lord, I do not grudge. My two strong sons that I have seen go out. To break their strength and die, they end a few— in bloody protest for a glorious thing. They shall be spoken of among their people. The generations shall remember them, and call them blessed. But I will speak their names to my own heart, in the long nights, the little names that were familiar runs round my dead hearth. Lord, thou art hard on mothers. We suffer in their coming and their going. And though I grudge them not, I weary, weary, of the long sorrow, and yet I have my joy. My sons were faithful, and they fought. "'But he, the good God, spared one of ours,' said John Ward, gently, after a moment of silence. "'Only to take the other away!' Mrs. Ward burst out, suddenly breaking down, to the doctor's real consternation, for she had not done that, even at the news of Albert's death. "'And Esther, too, if she goes with Bert! Lord, thou art hard on mothers!' Esther tried to comfort her, while Dr. Ward sat dumb. It will take Bert two or three years to get ready to go anywhere. You will have us all that time anyway. I had forgotten that, Mrs. Ward suddenly sat up and smiled. Of course it will. I kept thinking you were going right off. By the new plan outlined by the seminaries, young men like Bert can get ready to go out in one year, said the doctor. We have all that to go over in making our plans, but there is going to be a lot of adventure about the whole thing. Do you know, Dick is wondering what Requa's father will say. Both Mrs. Ward and Esther exclaimed, and Esther said decidedly, "'Requa will never go against her father's wishes. I know her too well.' "'Dick is afraid of Randall. Think of that, Sarah. 
a boy who wears the croix de guerre, afraid of his future wife's father. That girl, said Esther, with determination, has been one of the last to find out and feel the influence of the war on the woman of the world. I love Requa, and she's a splendid girl, and she loves Dick and worships him, but she's afraid of her father, and, you know, Daddy, why— Esther did not finish her sentence, and Dr. Ward did not either, but all three seemed aware of a chill in the room, which was dispelled when Dr. Ward said, "'Do you know what time it is, folks?' "'One o'clock,' said Mrs. Ward, as she rose. "'But yesterday was a great day. What it will mean to those young men no one can ever tell.' "'Or to the young woman either, father.' "'How? What's that?' Dr. Ward turned to his daughter, the surprises of the day not yet over. "'You know the girls in my class?' They were greatly stirred by your sermon, Daddy. They want to do something. And there's Alberta. Since Albert's going out, she must do something to fill life's cup for her. There are at least six of my girls, I believe, who want to get into some kind of service for all the world. Small things do not interest them any more. Only the biggest can appeal to them now. Do you mean to say that six of those high school girls in your class will actually consider the commission to go into the world to make disciples? Father, Esther said, "'coming up to him and putting her hand on his head. "'It is too late to tell all about it tonight. "'The girls would have been in to see you about it if the boys hadn't come. "'It's a great story they will have to tell you if they talk to you as they have to me. "'I don't believe even you really understand what the war has done for girls and women.' "'I don't, except when I look at you. "'You're not the same girl you were when the war broke out.' "'I hope not, Daddy. "'But you're tired after such a day. "'We'll go over it all in the morning.' Next morning at the breakfast table, the Ward family did what they always did, following the habit the children had known for years, in fact, ever since they were born. They discussed at the table the things they had been talking over when they parted at night. And there were few secrets in the Ward family. What concerned one of them concerned all. Even Esther's and Dick's love chapter in life was freely read by them to the father and mother, and on this occasion it played so vital a part in the future plans of all of them that it could not possibly be avoided, even if anyone had wished. "'Bert is the last fellow in the world I should have thought of as a missionary,' said Dick, following some remark his sister had made about his own choice. "'He isn't any more cut out for it than I am, but he told me yesterday he believed he had never felt more certain about anything since he volunteered in 241.' "'Bert has plenty of qualifications for missionary service,' said Esther, with her usual determined air. He likes people of all sorts. He's not afraid of any kind of circumstances. He learns languages easily. He can adapt himself to any sort of climate. He has perfect health. He is very persuasive. Ha ha! Exactly what Requa said of my qualifications as a foreign missionary. When we come to make our applications for missionary service, all Bert and I will have to do will be to refer to the secretaries or the board to our respective brides, who know all about us. And you will not be far out of the way, sir. I don't believe you realize, Dick. While you've been gone, how fast and far women have gone in learning to make quick judgment and to measure up to large opportunities. That's one reason you boys will have to do some pretty good thinking and hard work if you keep up with us, or fill the places you left when you went away. Dick answered soberly, admiring his sister's determination and her general air of wide awakeness. Bert and I haven't begun to catch on yet to the new things to which we have come back, if that is a good American language. Why— I didn't even know that the saloons were gone from Bradford until I went down on the street Saturday on the way to Requa's. It doesn't seem possible, Dad, how you used to pray for that day, but I never believed it would happen. We haven't had a saloon or a brewery in the whole state, said Dick's father calmly. What? Not a saloon in the whole state, Dr. Ward repeated. While well, you have been fighting over there, we've been fighting over here. Dick had risen in his excitement. As he sat down, he said, "'I don't see what there is left for you to preach about, Dad, if the saloons are gone.' "'There are a number of things left.' "'And we have woman's suffrage since you went away, Dick,' his mother added. Dick began to look bewildered, and Esther chimed in. "'There's hardly a man left in the flour mill or the furniture shops, "'and I suppose you noticed Alberta is in McAlpin's old place at the ticket office down at the depot.' Dick looked from Esther to his mother and then to his father, and after a moment of astonished silence he broke into a laugh. "'but it was a laugh that had questions in it. "'We got very little news on the fighting line. "'We were making European history. "'Didn't have time to note what was going on at home. "'On the way home, what do you folks think "'was the main topic of our talk and interest?' 
Father and mother and sister looked their keen interest, and Dick provokingly said, "'Sometime I'll tell you, but it wasn't prohibition, or woman suffrage, or government ownership of railroads, telegraph, and telephone service. I expect to be surprised every day at something new in America, but somehow it doesn't excite me much until I find about Requa and her father.' "'But you and Bert will never understand the greater part of the new order of things in America, Dick, if you don't know and understand something of the part that the women of America played during the war. I suppose you heard of the Red Cross over there?' Dick rose from his place at the table and gravely saluted. "'That's for the Red Cross. If there was one thing we did know, it was that. Yes, that and the YMCA. Some day I'll begin to tell you folks what it all meant to me.' "'But,' Esther persisted, do you know what the women of America did in the Red Cross? We're not jealous of the YMCA, but I don't believe even the people here at home begin to know what the Red Cross owes to the women of America. Daddy, you know I was appointed statistical secretary for our division to get the exact facts for the second year of the war, and here is what I found out. In one year of the war, the women of America planted 800,000 war gardens, out of which were raised $350 million worth of crops. 460 million quarts of food were preserved from these gardens in eight months, and a million loaves of bread saved each day. In addition to that, eight million women worked in 50,000 Red Cross workrooms. In six weeks, they delivered 3,681,895 surgical dressings, 1,517,76 pieces of hospital linen, 424,550 hospital garments, 240,621 knitted articles, and 301,563 miscellaneous supplies. During the entire year, 13 million articles were sent abroad, 3 million surgical dressings went every month to France, and 36 million dollars worth of garments for our own boys. "'Wait! I never knew you had such a memory!' cried Dick, in genuine astonishment. "'She never used to have any, Dick!' Dr. Ward exclaimed. "'She has made a memory where there wasn't any.' Dick looked with undisguised admiration at his sister. "'If the war has done as much for all the women as it has done for you, sister, it surely is a new world we have come back into. But I don't believe they are all like you. You don't mean to say, do you, that those figures represent official and United States facts?' The breakfast was getting cold. The Ward family had paused in the act of eating to digest Esther's figures. She had pushed back her chair from the table and was sitting there with a look of meditation. If any one except her brother had asked such a question, she would have been indignant. But she smiled as she said, "'Your ignorance of the world you have come back into is excusable. You and Bert and all the boys are going to be astonished a good many times. It's a new America and a new world. And I do feel for the first time that I've some real place in it. Just think, Dick, of the 766,202 professional women in this country.' "'Yes, Daddy, I am going to practice on you folks, now I have got to going, with my report as secretary.' In the fine arts there are 20,393 women listed in the women's who's who, 685 clergy, 490,250 teachers, 1,787 lawyers, 7,502 authors and editors, 144,451 are practicing medicine, 84,478 are teaching music, and 3,250 are in scientific pursuits as architects, chemists, civil and electrical engineers. Did you know that one little French woman was at the head of the hospital at Verdun for seventeen months? You must have heard of her. For six weeks she worked there without taking her clothes off. And now she's médecine en chef of the Hospital Militaire in Paris. Ten hospitals in Europe are staffed entirely by women. Seven great London hospitals have women resident physicians in charge. Endell Street Hospital, the greatest London war hospital, was staffed entirely by women. And did you know our Red Cross has been asked by France and Serbia for hospitals staffed by women? Didn't the boys find out that the place to go when they were wounded was the women's hospital in Paris? Dick did not answer as Esther paused in her tumultuous statistics. The mere figures seemed to be of little interest to him by the side of one sentence. Who was that doctor at Verdun? What did you say was her name? Why, it was Dr. Nicole Gerard Manging. When she sent in her application for an appointment as acting surgeon, she left off her first name, and the war office supposed it was a man. When she appeared with her surgeon's kit at the Vosges front with the government commission, the medicine-in-chief at that point threw up his hands in dismay at the sight of this little woman. And yet there were a thousand wounded soldiers at that point, and only five doctors. 
they had to let her get to work. And she assisted in four days at six hundred operations and never lost a case. Surely you must have heard of her. Heard of her? Of Dr. Nicole Gerard Manchin? Why, she is the doctor that amputated my arm and saved my shoulder. In his excitement, Dick had risen so suddenly that he knocked a cup and saucer off the table. No one paid any attention to it. Dick was waving his left arm enthusiastically. Esther was staring hard, while her eyes glowed. "'How splendid! But you never wrote us about it. How I should like to see her perform an operation!' "'Do you mean on me?' Dick laughed as he sat down. "'But how is it you did not write us about it?' Mrs. Ward asked. Dick looked ashamed. "'You know, mother, what a careless correspondent I was, and I kept saying I would tell it all when I came home. And there was wreck what to write to, and as soon as I was able to leave Paris and join the company, the thing was all over and I was on board. But Dr. Nicole, you can't tell me anything about her. Why, the boys saw her oftener than they saw Persing or Foch. And I shall carry her skill with me as long as I live. It was all so wonderful that a silence followed, broken finally by Dick, who, as he stooped over to pick up the broken cup and saucer, said, I might as well get right over and see Mr. Randall this morning. Dr. Ward looked at Mrs. Ward as if seeking an answer to the question they had been debating before the breakfast hour. He seemed to read his answer in her returning look, and with a good deal of reluctance he said, as Dick put the pieces of broken crockery on the table, "'Dick, we feel, your mother and I, that you ought to know a somewhat disagreeable fact before you go to see Mr. Randall. You haven't been home long enough to learn about things, and it may help you in your interview with him to know the facts from us, rather than have them come to you by way of those who are less friendly.' Dick sat down again, looking intently at father and mother and sister, all of whom returned his look with unusual gravity. "'The plain fact is,' Dr. Ward continued, with characteristic family bluntness, "'that Mr. Randall is a profiteer, and has made a large part of his recent fortune by evading government regulations. He has not yet done anything illegal to the extent of putting himself in reach of the law, but a few weeks ago he was under suspicion of such shrewd practice in the manipulation of warehouse securities that he may fall under government indignant and arrest. Have you heard anything of this?' No! Dick's one word was like a hand grenade. His face was white, and he clutched the tablecloth with the grip that made his mother, sitting opposite, apprehensive that he might drag all the dishes off the board. Why, he's a traitor! Dick exploded. Dr. Ward said gently, Bradford will give him the benefit of every doubt. Randall has lived here all his life. He has built up the shops and always been fair in his dealings with the men and generous in public ways with his money. He built the new hospital here the first year of the war. The people will be slow to accuse him, and yet I am obliged to believe that he has been caught up in the great temptation, which has caught so many of our businessmen in the unprecedented opportunities which war conditions have afforded, to pile up enormous gains in a short time. But Dick did not appear to listen. His face was white and stern. I wish I didn't have to know this. It doesn't seem possible that Wreck was dad is a traitor. Yes, he is dad, a traitor. Dick spoke hotly, answering a silent protest he saw in his father's gesture. Why, in England they would shoot men for things like that. Even if he was not legally and technically guilty of profiteering, if he has taken advantage of the war to make a fortune, or to take advantage of the public, he is a traitor. He is not a true American. Dr. Ward had never seen Dick angry before. He was not simply angry in any superficial or temporary feeling, but thoroughly stirred by his father's statement about Randall. It seemed to him like a monstrous thing, that while the young men were risking their lives and all they held dear in the name of real patriotism, the older men, safe at home, should see in the awful tragedy of the world only a good chance to make big money. It did not make any difference if a great number of men, some of them high in the business world, did the same. They were all guilty of treason and deserved the punishment of traitors. I thought you ought to know the worst from us before you went to see him about Requa his father was saying gently. It may be he can justify some of his business moves. I am not judging him, but he is, as I have told you, under shrewd government suspicion right now. It will not make it any easier for you to see him. Dick had already started to go out. Dad, I'm not afraid of him any more. I can't be afraid of any man for whom I have no respect. But he is Requa's father, Dick. You cannot forget that, his mother said anxiously. I shall not forget that either, mother said Dick softly, but his face was still pale and his look stern. "'Be careful, son,' Dr. Ward spoke calmly. "'Remember what you are going to see him about. You are not his judge and executioner. The state will take care of that. 
what other rights you have are invested in requa who has pledged you faithfully to be your wife and share in your future you are both old enough to make your own choices but randall is not all bad he might dick cast one look around at the three still seated at the table and went slowly out they heard him go upstairs to his room and after a few minutes he came down seemed to hesitate in the hall but finally opened the door and went out esther went to the window to wave a hand at him as she used to do before dick went away she was greatly disturbed because he did not turn to wave his hand at her in reply he went up the street without turning his head and crossed over to go up to requa's esther was crying as she came back to the table i never saw dick so upset do you think father it was wise to tell him about mr randall yes he would have had to know it soon anyway and perhaps from some of randall's political enemies but it is hard for dick to face all this right now End of chapter four chapter five of all the world by charles monroe sheldon this librivox recording is in the public domain recording by adele de Pignoles. chapter five four blocks away up the street stood mr randall's large house the handsomest in bradford strangers and visitors were taken past randall's as the show place of the town it sat back in a whole block surrounded by elms and tall shrubbery dick had been in the habit of calling at all hours and when he rang the bell he almost knew requa would open the door for they were early risers at randall's when she appeared and greeted him with a happy laugh at first for a few minutes of happiness he forgot all about the real object of his call he had been away so long from all home joys that it seemed to him almost like a dream to be with the girl he loved so deeply and gladly and nothing was said about the future the presence was so joyous with hope but mr randall passed through the hall and Dick saw his big form and heard his heavy step as he went on towards the front door. "'Is your father going down to the mill? I want to see him.' "'I'll call him.' Rekko went out into the hall. "'Father, Dick wants to see you before you go down.' "'All right. I thought I heard his voice.' Randall smiled as Rekko drew him back into the room. He greeted Dick heartily, for he liked him, and knew Rekko's devotion to this one-armed soldier boy who had so gallantly run the Croix de Guerre. "'I want to see you alone,' said Dick, a little stiffly. Requa looked anxious. "'I hope it's not anything very terrible,' she said, as she went out. Dick did not reply, as Mr. Randall closed the door. Outside in the hall, Requa stood a moment very gravely. She did not intend to listen, but she could not help hearing a loud exclamation from her father. Then, trembling a little, the girl went upstairs to her own room. She was there for half an hour— when she heard the door of the room downstairs suddenly opened, and someone came hastily out of the room, opened the front door, and went out of the house. When Mr. Randall had closed the door and turned to Dick, who was standing in the middle of the room, he could not have anticipated Dick's reason for this interview. Least of all was he prepared for his own part in it. Rufus Randall was one of the hundreds of businessmen in America who had found in the Great War an opportunity to make big money. He counted himself a good patriot, because he bought liberally of liberty bonds, and subscribed largely to the YMCA, the Red Cross, and the Armenian Relief. He had also, with the shrewd cunning of his type, put up a large hospital in Bradford, and endowed it generously. Bradford people generally regarded Randall as their leading citizen, as he was beyond doubt their richest. No one had thought of him as a profiteer until very recently. No one but himself knew what his profits were— or at least not until a government expert had examined his books. The mills employed some two thousand persons, two-thirds of whom were women, and his wages were higher than those paid in Bayview or Carlisle. People generally regarded Randall as a philanthropist, and if they had been putting down his occupation in who's who, they would probably have so designated him. There is no doubt he so regarded himself. The last thing in the world he ever thought himself to be was a hypocrite, what the people of Bradford thought of him, he thought of himself. Only a few clear-headed and morally balanced men like John Ward had so far caught a real glimpse of the man as he was, unscrupulous, eager for popular approval provided it did not cost too much, self-centered in his money-making, taking chances on the government overlooking his particular transactions on account of his reputation for patriotism and generosity, pouring the one personal affection he had clung to about Requa, his only child, absolutely selfish so far as other people were concerned, 
unless it was convenient for him to concede something to them. This was Rufus Randall, mill owner, hospital builder, first citizen of Bradford in his own estimation, pleased with himself and his prosperity, and well disposed, at this particular moment, on this particular morning, towards himself and the young man who was engaged to his daughter. "'Well, Dick,' he said, good-naturedly, as he closed the door, "'no use to ask why you have come over so early, eh? You wouldn't want to detain me very long, I'm sure.' I've come over to see you about Requa. Yes, of course. Well, I feel good-natured this morning. What is it, Dick? Mr. Randall. Dick was talking slow and thinking fast. Do you know what a number of us in the church, in Father's church, have decided to do? No. What is it? Randall and Requa belonged to a prominent church in Bradford, which had not yet joined with the other churches in the federated movement. I've decided to be a missionary. A what? A missionary. Rufus Randall stared at Dick in genuine astonishment. You a missionary? Yes, sir. The last thing in the world— Yes, that's what I thought, but I have made up my mind, and that is where Reco comes in. My future will probably be somewhere in Palestine or the East, after I am through with the necessary preparation. Of course, we want to be married before we go, and— Randall broke in on Dick, who with the word bluntness was coming directly to the point of his interview— "'Wait a moment, young man. Let's get down to practical matters. First of all, let's start clear. Do I understand definitely that you have positively, on an impulse, and with very small consideration, decided to make the—the the business of a missionary your life business?' "'Yes, sir.' "'On an impulse?' "'You might call it that.' "'I never heard of such a thing. It's not practical.' "'It's as practical as making money,' said Dick, beginning to warm up under Randall's sharp questions. "'But you haven't had time. You—' I asked Requa here last Saturday if you had any business plans, and she said you hadn't any. And now you say you have decided on being a missionary and going to—where did you say? Madagascar? Palestine, said Dick grimly, where little children and young mothers have been starving to death in very practical ways. But you—well, you say you have definitely decided on this sort of work as a life work. Being a missionary? Yes, sir. It's clear enough to me. Of course it will take some time. I don't know just how long to get ready to go over. "'but the thing I came to see you about was Requa. "'Of course it means her going with me.' "'Never! Not with my consent, Mr. Ward. "'I regard the whole thing as absurd and visionary. "'Look you!' "'Randolph suddenly pointed a big, heavy finger at Dick "'with a favorite gesture. "'What will you have to support a wife on as a missionary?' "'Dick realized his weak position at this point, "'and for a moment he hesitated. "'Then he boldly answered, "'I don't know. Not yet. "'But missionaries are not allowed to go out unless they are married.' and when they do go, they have a decent living. I shall be able to support my wife. Have you any money saved up? The question was sharp and blunt and practical, and Dick's answer was a little surprise to Bradford's most practical citizen. I had five hundred dollars in the bank when I left home. I have been able to save a thousand dollars during the war, and Albert's insurance money was left to me, some eight thousand dollars, payable in quarterly installments. I have enough to get married on. Oh, uh, um, I see. But your plan is fanciful. A missionary. Reku would die away from all her usual home comforts. It is not practical. It was at that point that Dick, recalling some of his war experience, and especially the events that occurred in Palestine with the Red Cross, the YMCA, and the Missionary Relief Committee, lost control of himself. He had been holding himself in check with splendid poise, remembering his father's caution. But now he seemed to see again that picture by the Jaffa Gate. THE BABY WITH THE DRY GRASS IN ITS MOUTH. PRACTICAL. MR. RANDALL, NOTHING ELSE IS PRACTICAL EXCEPT THE GOSPEL OF JESUS CHRIST. WHAT HAVE WE BEEN FIGHTING FOR OVER THERE? WHY HAVE ALL THE MONEYED CROWNS AND THRONES AND BUSINESSES OF THE WORLD BEEN UNABLE TO STOP THE KILLING AND THE HATE AND THE AWFUL WASTE OF LIFE? BECAUSE THEY ARE NOT PRACTICAL AND NEVER HAVE BEEN. I TELL YOU, MISSIONARIES ARE THE ONLY REALLY PRACTICAL PEOPLE THERE ARE. For if the world had spent its brains and money and energy in sending missionaries all over the world, the great war that we have just had would never have occurred. I salute the only real practical person this world ever saw, Jesus Christ my Lord, who told his followers to go into all the world and make disciples of the nations. Dick was not given to heroics, but somehow he suddenly found himself on his feet, and his left hand went up smartly in a salute and he stood at attention, a flush on his face and a look on his eye, which betrayed his unusual outburst. If Randall was impressed by anything, he never showed it. 
That's all right if you feel that way. But the business of a missionary is not for girls like Wekwa. I've always believed it's a man's business, and women ought not to be asked to go into it any more than into the fighting ranks of war. But Wekwa promised to be my wife, Mr. Randall. That may be, but she did not promise to be the wife of a missionary. She will never have my consent to such a life. No matter what you say about it is a precarious, poorly paid, exhausting, and killing sort of life, if we may believe the missionaries themselves, and I will oppose Requa's participation in it with you. I'm used to plain talking, and you are getting it from me now. I like you well enough, Dick, as an individual, and admire your war record, no man in Bradford more than I do, and I should be proud and pleased to have you as a member of the family. But I love Requa more than I love you, and she is all I have left, and— he spoke with a sudden passion, of which he was at times honestly capable in a heavy, impressive manner. "'I am not going to have her life rubbed out in the treadmill of a missionary's wife. She is not strong enough physically to endure the hardship. I tell you, Dick, she was not born for such a life, and I will not consent to such a sacrifice. And that's my ultimatum.' "'But what if Freck was willing to share the life with me?' "'She will never go against my wishes.' "'I will see about that.' Dick got up suddenly and started across the room. Randall watched him with curiosity, but had apparently no fear of the result. Then, without shifting his position or even raising his voice, he said, "'Sit down, Dick. I have an offer to make you that I honestly want you to consider. If you go to raising the question with Requa, it will create a lot of unpleasant feeling either way. I know she will never go against my wishes. It isn't that, but I believe we can settle this matter more satisfactorily.' Dick stopped halfway across the room and sat down in the nearest chair. He had not the slightest hint of Randall's plan, and as he went on unfolding it, Dick listened at first, as if Randall were proposing it to another. "'Why not settle this thing on a sensible business basis, Dick? I like you, and believe in your ability and your future. I need just such a bright, alert, keen-minded fellow as you in the mills. I've been short-handed all through this war, as everyone has been. I need, at this minute, a reliable man to take charge of my shipping department. You could learn the business inside a year or a year and a half at most.' You can put your capital, all you wish, into the business. With your ability, in time you could succeed me. If you should have children, they would be well cared for. Your father and mother need you at home after all this separation. It is not just the thing to leave them to a lonely old age. It is not fair to take Greco away from me, or try to persuade her to leave me. I need her near me. You can get married at once, and come right here to live, until you have your own home. That's my offer. Isn't it more sensible than your plan? Isn't a thing that appeals to your own sense of what is wholesome and natural? "'Come, Dick, come, my boy. Requa is out there now in the hall probably waiting for you. "'Go right out there and surprise her by telling her you have accepted an offer "'to go into business with her old dad, and may in time become a partner in the business.' "'Talking with his father on the evening of this same eventful day in his life, "'Dick confessed that as Randall's offer became more real to him, "'the greatest temptation of his life assailed him to accept it, marry Requa, and set he down.' And then the next moment his whole soldierly nature rose up in resistance, and he felt that he was a traitor to the best he had chosen, and to the world's real needs, as he had seen them himself over in Europe. And he found himself saying, calmly enough, but with the full strength of an assurance that he could not say anything else, "'I can't do it, Mr. Randall. I have made my choice before God. I cannot repudiate that without being a coward and a liar. I cannot and will not make denial of my convictions to go into all the world.' Randall at that lost control of himself. He had made the offer in good faith and in his most seductive manner as a business proposition. To have it turned down abruptly by this young man who had no experience and no prospects angered him greatly. "'Then you can make your choice and go your way, but Requa will not go a step with you. Fool! To reject an offer into the best business prospect in Bradford or the State. Why, in ten years you could be in my place, you fool!' The next moment Randall was sorry he had spoken in anger— but it was too late. What he had said and the way he said it roused Dick tremendously. He forgot his father's calm warning to remember he was not Randall's judge and executioner, forgot he was Requa's lover, forgot all that was at stake in the matter of Requa's possible attitude, if her father refused his consent to her going away, and with only the memory of what Dr. Ward had said about Randall's profiteering. Dick burst out, regardless of all consequences, and added to the rest, as he sat there that morning facing the father of the girl he loved, and who he hoped would go with him as his wife, was the scene in front of the Jaffa Gate, and the young mother with the starved baby, and the cry of America rang in his ears and called out against this man who had taken advantage of the great world tragedy to line his own pockets. 
News of affairs at home had come to the boys at the front in a somewhat irregular and desultory way, but the word profiteer had become well known, and the company was in the habit of speaking of this sort of man at home as the American Hun. As Dick recalled a scene at the Second Battle of the Marne, he saw as he drove his car back during a counter-thrust of the enemy, one of the American Marines plunge his bayonet clear through the body of a German, draw out the weapon, throw the soldier back, step on his head, crushing it clear out of sight in the horrible mud, and with a yell, spring like a wild beast on another German who had been close behind the first. The whole monstrous scene flashed out of Dick's memory as it flared up again in the fearful ending. For as the Marine plunged forward, his face lighted up with the blazing light of a burning pile of foodstuff. A shattering bomb struck the Marine full in the chest, tearing the upper torso apart, and the sacrifice was complete as the fragments fell scattered over the red soil of blood-soaked France, one of thousands who died that day for human freedom. And here at home, in his ease, sleek, well-fed, self-centered, self-satisfied, and physically safe, was a man who called himself an American, and was willing that the Marine should give his life, and boys like Dick be mutilated for it, while he made his exorbitant profits at home, nursing what conscience he had by building a hospital, or buying liberty bonds as a good investment financially. What Dick had said under the impulse of passion, provoked by the entire interview, was simply this. I wouldn't be in your place, Mr. Randall, for all the money the war has cost. Your place. If the government finds you guilty of profiteering, your place may be and ought to be a state prison. For one moment, Randall sat perfectly still, staring at Dick with a rage that turned his cheeks first white and then purple with passion. Then he started up, and for a second Dick thought he was going to strike him. But Randall, after raising a clenched fist and holding it up a moment, suddenly dropped it and laughed. Profiteer, you are not my judge as to that. I have a clear case with the government, but I don't have to defend myself with you. I— And at that point, as if not certain of himself, or as if assailed by a fear he did not wish to betray to Dick, Randall got up abruptly, went out of the room, walked heavily through the hallway, and went out, closing the door with a bang. That was what Requa had heard, and she came down at once, not knowing whether it was her father or Dick who had left the house. Dick met her in the doorway, and she saw at once that something serious had happened. Dick drew her back into the room, and said, Requa, do you know what I came to see your father about this morning? No. Dick told her briefly, emphasizing his own choice, and making clear his conviction that in making his choice, he had deliberately decided his life work. Do you mean, dear Dick, that we would have to leave Bradford, and go to Palestine, or some foreign country, to live all our days? Requa asked, and Dick noted, with a strange sinking of his heart, that she was trembling as if with fear. Yes, that is what it will mean. It will be a life of adventure and of sacrifice. But father will never consent. Yes, he has just told me so. But what do you say yourself, Requa? Will you go with me? Dick put the question with the usual ward characteristic of abrupt and positive coming to the point. The girl hesitated. She had been luxuriously brought up. Her father had been to her since her mother's death and until Dick Ward had come into her life the one person in all the world to whom her thought and affection had gone out. Then suddenly, and it seemed to her cruelly, she was confronted with the necessity of making a choice, which either way it lay meant disappointment and trouble, for one or the other of the two people who were most to her. In that moment of hesitation, Dick read his worst fears. The woman who really loved him, he said to himself, should have answered at once without reservation, Where thou goest, I will go. Thy God shall be my God, thy people my people. But what he heard from Wekwa after that painful pause was this question. Is there no other way? Do you mean to make this choice for us both? I have already told you, Wekwa, Dick was saying calmly enough outwardly, though inwardly his heart was in a tumult. I rest with you to choose between your father and me. Give me time, Dick. Don't ask me to choose it now at once. But what difference will time make, Wekwa? The choice will always have to be the same. Will you live your life with me or not? If I were asking you to come into a wrong or doubtful life, that would be different. But— Requa's face expressed fear, doubt, indecision, deep trouble. It had not been hard for her to love her absent soldier. And when he came home, no one in Bradford had been prouder or happier than she. But for almost the first time in her easy-going life, she had to make a serious decision— it is doubtful if she understood in any adequate way Dick's decision in its purpose and its sacred meaning to him. Then suddenly her face lighted up, 
and almost laughed, as if she had discovered an answer to her perplexity. "'Dick, oh, Dick, why do you have to go as a missionary? Why can't you stay here and do just as much good? Father was saying only yesterday that he needed a man in the mills, in the shipping department, I think it was. I know if I ask him he'll let you have the place. Dick, dear Dick, think how long you have been away, and now you plan to go again. Think how happy we can be here at home. You are so quick you can learn the business in a short time.' Perhaps in time you will succeed, father, to the business. Find yourself actually in his place. And we could get married, Dick, as soon as you wish, Dick. That is, as soon as I can get ready. And father would love to have us stay here, Dick, right here in this house. It is so big. We could have a big corner of it all to ourselves. Oh, say you will, Dick, say you will, and we shall all be happy. Again, talking frankly with his father that night, Dick confessed to him that Wreck's appeal seemed to him to be more than he could resist. Never had she looked so lovely, and he had been gone so long from all womankind, from all the possibility of a home of his own. Once, in critical passages, the mere thought that he would ever live to enjoy such bliss seemed so remote that nothing but a succession of miracles could make it real. And here it stood, now really within arm's reach, personified in this glorious, radiant, blushing girl, who had promised to be his wife, and make with him that sacred and adorable place, home." Why not take this gift of the gods, and without too many serious questions, be happy? And then again, as in the case of her father, Dick seemed to see down the trenches lines of foully bespattered human beings, the semblance of humanity, gashed with innumerable tokens of sleeplessness, watching, weariness, shell-shock, bearing in their bodies and in their memories the marks of the cruel war, holding grimly on to the things the flag stood for willing to suffer and die a hundred horrible deaths in order that the world might be safe and millions happy instead of a few like himself and Requa. And then over the trenches flamed the ghastly banner flying above old glory, blazoned with the word profiteer, with Requa's father's name after it, branded with indelible treason. And she was asking him, the soldier, who had risked his life to free the world from just such egotists as Randall, to become a possible partner in the business that had the stain on it, after he had won the cross in a battlefield with a pure and loyal patriotism that no one could ever question. Requa was very near him. Next moment she would have yielded to his embrace. But his first word was so like a blow that she stepped back hastily and threw her hands up as if to ward off her lover. Requa, do you know I could never enter into a partnership with your father's business, because the government at this moment is making an official gamination of his books, and he is likely to be arrested and fined as a profiteer. Requa, I would just as soon repudiate my American citizenship and go over to the Germans and try to secure the commercial business of which they have been stripped by the war, as to be associated with your father, is the business which he has apparently conducted for his own selfish profit, while other men have been fighting for the world's life. Now Requa Randall, like other girls, daughters of rich men in America, who know nothing of the intricate affairs of business, if she ever thought of it at all, thought of it as a source of her physical happiness and her father was to her a kind, indulgent, affectionate father. Like a blow on her heart, here stood her lover, the person she loved next to her father, charging him with monstrous wrong and actually calling him selfish. And she drew back, threw up her head, and said the first angry word she had ever spoken to her soldier lover. "'Richard Ward, my father is the soul of honour. Anyone who tries to cast dishonour on him is no friend of mine. Do you understand that?' Dick received the blow standing. He was pale and sweat stirred on his forehead. Requa, he said gently, I do not think you understand your father's business. I don't feel able to argue with you. I have received the answer to my question. You are not willing to go with me. Oh, Requa, I don't know how I can bear it. Yielding to his feeling, Dick suddenly rushed past Requa out into the hall, and had opened the door just as Requa, swiftly repentant of her anger, came running out and crying, Oh, Dick, dear Dick, don't go. I don't understand it at all. You know I love you dearly. Dear Dick, I'm sorry. I will— But Dick did not even turn. He shut the door and ran down the steps, and Rekko ran into her own bedroom, flung herself on her bed, and sobbed, alternately speaking her father's name and her lover's, crying out in the first deep grief of her not over-deep heart. End of chapter 5《Chapter Six of All the World by Charles Monroe Sheldon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Adelda Pinoles. Chapter Six. While Dick was having his experiences with Rufus Randall and Requa that Monday morning, 
Dr. Ward and Bert Chandler were holding a very interesting conference in the doctor's study, where Bert had gone after a reasonable visit with Esther, who had then retired to the kitchen to help her mother. Dr. Ward felt greatly interested in Bert, not only because he was to be his son-in-law, but because he had never understood how Esther, with her strong, intellectual, positive character, could give herself so unreservedly and even submissively to this comparatively uneducated, slow-moving young man, some six or seven years her elder. He had met Esther from the very first as an equal at the very time in her life when she was sought by numbers of the most attractive young men in Bradford, and to the surprise of everyone she had accepted him. He had gone into Company 241 as a private and ended in the same place. He had won no medals, and had not distinguished himself in any special manner. But he had been wounded in six different places, and had an indifference to danger so marked that even in a company that was distinguished for courage, he was often quoted by his comrades. No one had ever heard him utter a word of complaint or of jealousy, because some of the boys had received promotions and honorable mention over him. Bert always seemed to be somewhat surprised at himself that he was alive after all he had been through, and cheerfully grateful for that one fact. "'There's a fellow in Battery B, down on the border, who got the war medal engraved by Congress, and he used to wear it outdoors quite often,' Bert said one day, when the boys were asking him where he kept his decorations. And one day, a Mexican sniper across the Rio Grande saw the glimmer of this medal on the soldier's proud chest. "'That soldier has a fine monument to his memory in the home cemetery, but I don't envy him the honor. I'd rather be here. I've always had a sort of hankering to be alive.' Bert began his conference with Dr. Ward by asking sensible questions about the preparation necessary for his missionary service. "'I'm too old, Dr. Ward, to go to college and medical school afterwards. What shall I have to do to fit myself for service as a worker in a hospital?' Dr. Ward leaned forward, and his face reflected his intense interest in the subject. "'While you have been gone, Bert, some radical changes have occurred in the management of our missionary affairs.' I needn't go into detail, but under the combination of all our foreign missionary societies, of all the denominations, we have schools of preparation for special fields in different parts of the world. Undoubtedly, with the practical experience you have had in the ambulance service, you could get ready to go to most any field for a hospital service within a year or year and a half at most. Have you thought of the place where you want to go? Yes, sir, I have, and so has Esther. We want to go to Mexico. How? Mexico! "'Well, Dr. Ward, I was down on the border during the trouble with Villa, you remember.' "'I had forgotten it.' "'I was there a year and a half before the war broke out in Europe, "'and was transferred to Ambulance 241 at Captain Howard's recommendation. "'Things I saw down there on the border made me want to be appointed "'General Superintendent of Mexico's Education Bureau. "'We captured a bunch of raiding Mexicans one night, "'and among them were two Yaquis. "'One of them was sick, and when I got off duty, I was allowed to nurse him.' He got well and followed me all over camp like a dog. I believe he really thought a good deal of me. A month later he was shot and killed trying to escape across the line. He was brought back by the sentry who shot him, and before he died he spoke to me of his wife and children. Dr. Ward, that Yaqui, Alamero, seemed to me to be the cry of unregenerate, undeveloped, benighted Mexico. They can say what they like of Alamero and his tribe, but I know he was capable, mentally and morally, of development into a noble Christian specimen. And wouldn't it be an adventure of a lifetime, Dr. Ward, if Esther and I could go down there and by some miracle actually find Alamero's wife and children and help make real humans out of them? It was the longest speech Dr. Ward had ever heard Bert make, and in a flash it opened up the young man's real inner life as he had never suspected it. Of course it would. The greatest need of poor old Mexico is education and Christian development. And you are right about the Yaquis. They have every fundamental quality to build fine manhood on. All they lack is the opportunity. Now that Mexico has settled down to some form of stable government, and has won the confidence of the United States, and is welcoming our school teachers and missionaries, you couldn't go to a finer place to work. Tell me how far you went in your medical service in the ambulance. Bert modestly and briefly, as if ashamed of his long speech, mentioned one or two things that made Dr. Ward gasp in astonishment. Do you mean to say you actually know how to perform amputations and even operate for abdominal troubles? You are not a certified M.D. Well, you know, there wasn't always time to work up to a degree over there. Once we brought in fourteen fellows in one car, and when we got them up to the base there were only four surgeons there. The others were dead for sleep, and nine had been bombed to death the night before in a hun raid on the hospital. Sir Underwood and Nelson and I sawed off five legs and three arms and a few feet and fingers, and when we were in doubt, Underwood read directions out of a medical book, 
telling us whether to use a hammer or a pair of scissors, and then Nelson and I went ahead as well as we could, asking Underwood to read slower when we weren't quite certain. And if I do say it, Dr. Ward, most of our operations turned out pretty well. It was either doing what we did, or letting the fellows die anyway. We hadn't any right to do what we did, but no one ever court-martialed us for it. And I don't dare tell how many abdominal operations I assisted in. I saw so many of these that I believe I could take out your appendix, Dr. Ward, without the help of a lantern at night. I don't believe you need a year and a half of preparation, Bert. Seems to me you had pretty good preparation over there. If I had appendicitis and were a Mexican or Yaqui in Mexico and I couldn't get a certified surgeon who had graduated with a sheepskin, I believe I would trust you to operate on me. But I should insist on a lantern, or at least a candle. Well, you see, sir, in case I should be unprepared at any point, Esther could go on with it. She tells me she has had two years already in the new hospital course here at Bradford, and has assisted in many major operations. I feel certain that in a tight place, Esther can work on the patient while I read the directions. Have you talked with Esther about Mexico? Yes, sir, and she is even more enthusiastic about it than I am. She is quite certain we shall find Alamero's family. And you have really settled on your place of work? I feel quite sure of that, and we want to prepare accordingly. Dr. Ward was extremely interested in the whole thing. You don't know, Bert, but there is a splendid course of preparation in the American Missionary College for separate fields of the world. You can enter the Mexico section and at once. It is well organized and will be worth everything to you. Does this American college take in married couples? Why, yes, I think so, said Dr. Ward, falling back in his chair with a somewhat startled expression. I think Esther and I could do better works in our preparation if we were married. You don't object, do you? I understand that Mrs. Ward and yourself were willing we should be married as soon as feasible after the war was over. It's all right, Bert, for your mother and me. May I ask you a plain question? How about your finances? Yes, sir, I'm glad you asked. I believe Esther and I can live in Mexico on what I have been able to save up. And before that time, I think I have enough to keep us both while we are preparing. But you will have a salary under the American Missionary Society, ample enough to support you both. Don't forget that. Of course, you do not know anything about the changes that have taken place in the religious life of the nation during the war. But all the missionary societies in the United States have combined and pooled their purses for one financial drive that has already begun, and promises to knit for missionary work of the world ten or twenty times any amounts ever received or given. Well, I'm glad of that, of course, Dr. Ward, because Esther and I can do better work if we don't have to provide our own salaries. But as to my finances, I can take care of the two of us all right. I forgot my $10,000 insurance money, but hold on, I can't use that, can I? Because I'm not dead yet. That's quite a lot of money for a dead person to have to spend. I believe I'd rather be alive. They were interrupted by the appearance at the study door of Esther, who came to say that three of her Sunday school class wanted to see the doctor about their decisions if he was not too busy. By all means, have them come right in. But first, Esther, here's a young man who wants to take you away from us down to Mexico. Before he goes, he wants to take you with him to the American college to prepare. And he says he has the means, without using his insurance money, to support you. What do you say? I say, replied Esther, going up to Bert, who had risen the moment she appeared, that I am ready to go with him anywhere, and that I would rather go to Mexico than anywhere else in all the world. You have my blessing and your mother's. Go out and fix the date and send in those pupils of yours. Esther was not ordinarily an impulsive girl in her affections, but she ran over to her father, kissed him heartily, and came back to where Bert stood. "'My heart trouble is getting worse all the time,' Bert was saying as the two went out of the study. "'I not only have heart trouble when you eye me, but I feel palpitations when you do a thing like that to your father. What do you suppose is the reason?' Dr. Ward did not hear what Esther said, but a happy laugh came rippling back into the study from two of the happiest young people in the world, and he said to himself, Thank God for happiness. The awful war has not killed it. That young man will make Esther not only happy, but contented in a real home. I feel certain of it. The doctor rubbed his glasses, put them back, and rose to welcome Esther's girls, who came in to give their experiences and ask for counsel. This group was followed within an hour by another, and in the evening some of the young men came in. History was being made fast, and great matters were discussed in the days before another Sunday came around. Dick came in before the luncheon hour that day, and went right up to his room. When his mother called him, he called down the stairs that he was not hungry, and asked the others not to wait for him. "'I'm afraid Wreck was disappointed him,' Esther said anxiously. "'I saw him as he went up to his room, just after the girls went away, and he looked pretty downhearted. 
"'Poor Dick. I wonder if Requa did refuse.' "'He will tell us,' Dr. Ward said, but his face was grave and his manner troubled. Late that night, Dick stole down from his room to his father's study. As a little boy, Dick had gone to his father with every trouble, large and small. During the war, his father's letters had revealed to the son a wealth of affection and understanding which he had never known his dad possessed. Instead of growing apart during that awful separation, the two had struck up a rare friendship and understanding. Dr. Ward found out that during that correspondence, desultory and discontented as it was, that the boy who had gone away somewhat reckless and thoughtless had qualities of the rare sort, courage, patience, endurance, a fine sense of loyalty, devotion to duty, joy in suffering, and a remarkable understanding of what America was in the war to do. On his side, the lad had learned for the first time what a rare character his father was, how far-sighted and unselfish and devoted he was to his life work, what great ideals he had, and how steadily and quietly he tried to live up to them. All this the son found out after months of separation. And the confidence Dick reposed in his father that night was the supreme proof of the eternal friendship the great war had established between them. At the end of half an hour Dick was sobbing like a child, his head on his father's desk, his empty coat sleeve pathetically dangling over the arm of his father's chair, as the doctor laid his hand on the lad's head and tried to say a word of comfort. "'Surely Reckle will decide at last to go with you, no matter what her father says.' "'I don't know, Dad. She seemed to me absolutely set against it, and I've been imagining a horrible thing. Suppose the government should make out a case against Mr. Randall. Could they send him to state prison? And if so, I could not ask Requa to go with me then.' "'The cases so far proved by the government have resulted only in heavy fines. But popular feeling is growing that imprisonment is the only real punishment. It is within the possibilities that Randall may suffer as an example. Here is an item that shows how people over the country feel.' Dr. Ward picked up a newspaper and read from a column of New York News, New York Drive being million from tax dollars. New York, August 11th, Special. As the result of a drive inaugurated by the Collector of Internal Revenue for the 2nd New York District, more than $1 million have been realized from persons who sought to evade income, excess profits, and commodity taxes. A single delinquent tax payment Saturday was for $100,000. Note. This is one of scores of similar items sent out by the Associated Press. The people are beginning to demand imprisonment for men who cheat the government in this manner, Dr. Ward went on. It is one of the most disheartening things in our whole history, that during the war, and now when it is over, there are thousands of men in America who have no standards of morals and no definitions of patriotism. While you boys were fighting over there for the freedom of the world, these men over here like Randall have been fighting for profits. Next to the Germans, they are the most hated of any class in America. Some of them have only just begun to find it out. Randall, unless I am mistaken, is one, and he would be glad to make restitution now if there is any way out. Did he seem at all disturbed when you called him a profiteer? Dad, he started to say something like a defense. Then he looked at me as if he was afraid of something, broke off his sentence in the middle, and got up and went out, storming along the hall and banging the door like one beside himself. Innocent men do not act as he acted. I'm afraid he is guilty, Dick, because in every case so far brought by the government, indictments have been brought, without an exception. Dad, what shall I do? What will Requa do, if her father has to pay the penalty of imprisonment? It seems too horrible to imagine. I can't answer your question, Dick. You have come home to real trouble, lad. Stand up like a soldier and trust your Heavenly Father for strength, for vain is the arm of man in cases like these. They talked late into the night. And before Dick went upstairs to his room, his father prayed, kneeling by the side of the boy, an arm over his shoulder, commending him to the good God for comfort and strength in this time of unusual trial. And when Dick went out of the study, he carried with him some gleam of hope for the future. But in what way it would be realized, he could not possibly determine. But as the week passed, it smote Dick with a fresh blow that Requa sent no word, and he did not attempt to call. Esther, in a burst of feeling, late in the week offered to go and see Requa and have a talk with her, but Dick, whose heart was sore and whose mind was in a turmoil, declined her offer, and almost frightened her by the stern attitude he assumed, when he declared that the affair lay entirely between Requa and himself. It was for her or her father to speak the next word. End of chapter 6《ハッピーバーデイ》《ハッピーバーデイ》《ハッピーバーデイ》《ハッピーバーデイ》《ハッピーバーデイ》《ハッピーバーデイ》《ハッピーバーデイ》《ハッピーバーデイ》《ハッピーバーデイ》《
Recording by Adelde Pinaroles. Chapter 7 Matters were in the same condition when Sunday dawned again. The government case against Randall had been published by the local press, and a sensation had followed. Dr. Ward found he had only one theme for his sermon. During the week, scores of his young people had been to see him, in addition to the boys of Company 241. The enthusiasm for the new adventure was growing far beyond anything he had dreamed. His message was a repetition of that of the Sunday before, only this time directed to the outlining of the program to be followed in carrying out the divine command. There were many things to tell this group of young heroes of the Marne and the Vessel and the Ois, who had lived in the atmosphere of excitement and of great deeds so long that nothing trivial or unimportant had any attraction for them. And there was so much to tell them of the new things at home, of which they were ignorant, many of which, like the organization of the American Missionary College and the fact of national prohibition, even if known, had to be emphasized to these eager souls looking out on a new America and into the gateways of a new world, whose every land under the sun was waiting to see what America would do to build up the world democracy she had so splendidly helped to create. The imagination of these young people was stirred to battle fervor by Dr. Ward's sermon. A hush of God's spirit fell over the congregation at its close. The most thrilling assurance came to minister and people that the Christ was in the house. The carrying out of his great command to go into all the world was evidently the one thing the church needed to realize his presence. All through the years before the war, no great passion had filled the church in America except the passion for self-development. Now it seemed to the people sitting there in the quiet of that room as if a real reason for existence had been given them. Here sat through the audience their own sons, husbands, brothers, and lovers, consecrating themselves to this thrilling adventure of conquest of all the world, to the sway of Christ Jesus as Lord of all. The great armies had disbanded, and the soldiers had come home to go back into industrial and agricultural life. And for the first time since man began his struggle for life on the globe, a universal peace reigned. All doors were open to the gospel. Millions were hungering for the truth. The world was thirsting for God, and America, with her wealth practically untouched even by the war's exhausting drain, with her fields ripe with food, with her thousands of young men and women filled with the adventure of action, seemed to wait for the call of the divine reveille to awake and go forth to the greatest task that humanity had ever laid upon it, a new and glorious call to the colors of the blood-stained cross. Dr. Ward made no appeal for volunteers this Sunday, but that evening, after the services of the day were over, the little study at the parsonage was not big enough to hold the groups that came. They were quiet young men, these ex-soldiers, but as their pastor, Dr. Ward, knew from their individual histories that he was facing heroes, and spirits tempered in the great discipline of danger, his heart thrilled as he thought of the wonderful material America now possessed for the Christianizing of the world, material full of courage, patience, endurance, intelligence, passion, vision, imagination, love of country and all it stood for, men who had known what it meant to fight for freedom, and had caught more than a glimpse of what that freedom meant to the world. No such evangelizing forces had ever been known in the history of the church. His prayer, as he led this expectant group, was a prayer of desire that the church in America might see her great, her wonderful wealth of missionary power, and use it to conquer the world for a democracy that would be Christ. Prayer filled the room. The hush of the Spirit's power awed this little group. And before Dr. Ward dismissed them, he outlined a simple form of expression of their pledges, and they talked it over together, agreeing finally on these statements as defining in simple language their purpose and the way to attain it. Dr. Ward said in explanation, We do not need any organization beside the church. All that these sentences are intended to do is shape our own thoughts and help define it for our action. But we need to remember that Christ's commands, while eternal, are also to be interpreted in the terms and under the conditions of the age in which we live. That is the beauty of his teachings, their adaptability to every person in every country in every age, and to all the world. Suppose, then, we let the following define for us our object, our purpose, and the means of reaching it. We choose for our name and motto, All the World. Our object is to make Christian disciples everywhere. We pledge ourselves to the surface, after careful preparation, going wherever we may be best fitted to go. The sources of our power we recognize to be 1. Jesus Christ, the Redeemer of all men, and the only real Reconstructor of the world. 2. Faith in prayer and the daily practice of it. 3. 
faith in the Holy Spirit to show men the truth as it is in Jesus. 4. Faith in the possible regeneration of any one of any race. 5. Faith in a united Christendom to do what individual Christianity cannot do. We believe that making all nations disciples mean 1. Working for the real union of all believers. 2. Seeking the help of the entire nation in the use of power. 3. Centralizing missionary effort by the union of different denominational bodies. 4. Appealing to the heroic and adventurous in young life to do more than militarism can do to inspire courage and sacrifice. 5. The elimination of race, hatred, and prejudice as a cardinal doctrine of our pledge. 6. All our effort centers in Jesus Christ, who is alive today and all-powerful in heaven and on earth. 7. And our creed is his creed, supreme love to God and supreme love to fellow man. After the young people had gone on home, one young woman stayed with the family for the night. She is a vital part of this history, and a word is necessary about her. Alberta Chester had been engaged to Albert Ward when the war broke out. The date had been set for their marriage while he was in training camp. Then the order had suddenly come from headquarters, which put Albert and a few other officers at a few hours' notice on a transport, and three weeks afterwards Alberta received a cable, the first word after long days of silence, saying her lover was somewhere in France. The first letter told her that he had been one of a dozen specially selected men from the States to go over and confer with the French aviators on matters of technique and airplane construction, in which Albert had begun to prove himself a rare expert. Then, like a bomb out of an invisible airplane, there fell like in the heart of Alberta the news of Albert's death in an air duel. He had been sent up to experiment with a new type of machine, had met a German squadron, had sent down two of their planes, and then had been mortally wounded by four enemies, who set upon him in a body. He was able to guide his machine back over the French lines, and died in the arms of his fellow officers, who wept honest tears over his beautiful body, and buried it with high military honors in the soil of France, sending back to Dr. and Mrs. Ward and Alberta a note signed by names, some of them afterward distinguished, giving the last record of Albert's heroism, including the prayer they had found folded neatly in one of his breast pockets. Albert's silver aviation badge finally came to Dr. Ward with his other personal effects. When the package was opened, Alberta was present. She fingered with tearless eyes one little token after another, but when the badge dropped out of a bit of tissue paper, she held out her hand, and Dr. Ward let her take the symbol of the airman, and Alberta took it to her lips, and with the act, her grief burst in a flood of tears that relieved her breaking heart. Without a word of protest, Dr. Ward saw her pin the badge on her dress, and there she wore it always. Alberta Chester was neither in her own feeling, maid, wife, or widow. The vision of the memory of her lover continued in her almost like a sainted personality, enshrined in her soul, something that might have been a lover husband, father of beautiful children, around whom her arms might have been enfolded, as she with him trained them into noble lives for the good of the world. She was not a girl to live in the solitude of her grief. She had been very practical in her thought and action. And so Albert's death did not materially change Alberta's daily struggle. Her old mother had been dependent on her work, and she had been a stenographer in one of Rufus Randall's offices at sixty dollars a month. As the war went on, and man after man was drafted and went away, the other places were vacant. The station agent at the Bradford Railway Station enlisted. To the consternation of Dr. Ward and all of Alberta's friends, she applied for the position. She wanted more physical exercise than stenographer's work could give, and in course of time the Bradford travelling public grew accustomed to see Alberta, clad in overalls, selling tickets at the window, and then going out on the platform throwing trunks up on the truck, checking them, and helping the trainman shove them into the car. But Alberta, after work hours, and clad in a distinctly feminine garb, was another person. She sat in the family circle this Sunday evening as one of them, respected and loved for the strength and poise and endurance she had shown in the great experience through which she had passed. They were all discussing the events of the day, and Dr. Ward had just checked off all the names of those who had made definite decisions, when Alberta said suddenly, "'Father, you have not put my name down.' Dr. Ward looked up in astonishment. "'Alberta, you are not going to leave us.' "'I want to go to France. I want to see Albert's grave.' I've been studying French language and history all winter. I can help in the orphanages. I can do reconstruction work in the orchards. I can preach the gospel in some form to the people. 
and I cannot bear to stay here if Esther and Dick are gone. And so Alberta became a part of the great adventure that had all the world for its theatre, and her part was played so well that it has a special importance in this narrative. Monday morning, following that eventful second Sunday, Dr. Ward was called up on long distance from Bayview before he was through breakfast. Chaplain Willis Hunter's voice sounded with special and peculiar emphasis. "'Dr. Ward, I want to see you this morning if you are not too busy. May I come over?' "'By all means, Hunter. I'll be more than glad to see you.' "'One of my men will bring me over in his car. Look for me before noon.' "'Stay to dinner with us,' Dr. Ward said, but he found that Hunter had already hung up. Before eleven o'clock Hunter appeared in his friend's car, and his first words revealed to Dr. Ward his tremendous interest in the errand that had brought him over the forty-five miles between Bayview and Bradford. Yesterday I presented to my people the great adventure to go into all the world, and the result was so wonderful, Dr. Ward, I felt I must come over and see you about it. The Spirit was with us in great power. Seventy-five of my young people are ready to take up the great commission and go into all the world. We had a wonderful meeting last night. I feel almost frightened over some phases of it. Yesterday was my first Sunday home with my church. I tried to talk on my experiences and my adventures, but without any volition of my own, my message was directed to the great command. People broke down all over the church. The thing got beyond any control of mine. I do not know where it will lead to. Only, as I said a week ago when I went with the boys here, I believe the life we have just been living is comparatively uneventful by the side of this big thing we are going to. I want to counsel with you. I feel the need of all the wisdom and strength I can get. This thing is of God. If it spreads through our churches and over America, it will revolutionize our church life, and what it will do in the world at large, only the divine can measure. Chaplain Hunter spent the day with Dr. Ward. He and his churchmen took dinner with his family, and Hunter had the joy of a visit with Dick, although he could not fail to detect the fact that some unusual and trying experience was being felt by the boy of his whose life he had saved over there. But everyone felt the contagion of Hunter's fiery enthusiasm. His last words that afternoon, as he started back to Bayview, were, "'The age of miracles is not over, doctor. I look for the Spirit's power in this matter as I have never seen it, not even on that last wonderful battlefield across the Meuse where we were finally victorious.'" That was late Monday afternoon. Dick had been roused by the visit of his old chaplain, but as soon as he was gone, the depression under which he had been living since his last set of Rukwa seemed to weigh him down, and after brooding in his room a while he came out of the house and walked recklessly downtown. Dick walked down one block, crossed over one of the diagonal paths leading through the courthouse grounds, and going on across the street on the other side, found himself in front of the office of the evening journal. An unusual crowd was on the sidewalk reading the bulletins, and Dick went over. When he caught sense of the first note on the bulletin, he heard the newsboys calling it out as they came running down the street. Rufus Randolph, convicted as a profiteer by the government, must serve a sentence. That was as far as the bulletin went. Dick stopped a boy with papers and bought a copy. He read enough after the first headlines to see that Randall had been found guilty, and unless he was pardoned by the president, he would have to serve a term in the federal prison. Rukwa. The name escaped him as he crushed the paper in his pocket. And then acting, as he always had, on the impulse that first prompted him, he turned out of the square towards the street where Rukwa lived. When he reached the house, he saw a small group of men gathered on the opposite side of the street. Dick went on up the walk steadily and rang the bell. As he waited for the door to open, his mind was quite clear as to his action in either case, whether it should be Requa or her father who should first appear. End of chapter 7「Chapter 8 of All the World by Charles Monroe Sheldon. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Adele Pinaroles. Chapter 8 it was Requa who opened the door. At sight of Dick, she turned very pale, and without a word started to close the door in Dick's face. But he put his foot against it, came in, shut it, and leaned back on it. "'I've just heard the news about your father, Requa, and had to come.' Requa looked at him strangely. "'You had to come? Have you read the account in the paper?' "'Yes. Your father is convicted by the government. He has been sentenced. It does not seem possible. Requa, dear, I had come to comfort you.' "'To comfort me?' Requa, I have not seen you for days, not since I was here last. What would you think of me if I should refuse to come in this great trouble? Why did you not send for me? Have you read the account in the paper? Requa asked hysterically. Yes, enough to know your father is sentenced. 
But you have not read all. That is not all. If you had read all, you would not be here in this house. What do you mean, Requa? You have a paper there in your pocket. Requa pointed a trembling figure at the paper Dick had bought. Read that before you touch me. Requa drew back his depth step closer to her. He drew the paper out of his pocket, and smoothing it out, began to read more of the details under the headlines. As he read on, he became so absorbed, so horribly interested in the government narrative, that he forgot where he was, forgot Requa's presence, forgot everything, but the expert official statements he was reading, statements that convicted Rufus Randall of a crime so great that he wondered, as he read on, what action his father could take when he knew all. These are a few paragraphs which burned into his memory. Facts brought out by the government investigation prove that Rufus Randall's mills furnish parts for airplanes, including stretched cotter pins and wing skids. Numbered parts have been traced to defective planes used by our aviators in France. It is conclusively proved by these numbered parts that material furnished by the accused, Rufus Randall, was so defective that the lives of several gallant men were endangered, and some were actually lost. In reply to request from investigating committee officers of blank aviation section, division blank of flying corps, American Experiment Company Number Blank, we regret to say that the death of Lieutenant Albert Ward was due in part, if not wholly, to a defective plane, parts of which were issued from Rufus Randall's mill in Bradford, September Blank. Lieutenant Ward had engaged the enemy, which had attacked him in squadron formation. He had sent one German albatross down in flames and had attacked another, when his machine was seen to crumple up on one of its wings. He was seen by observers to crawl out on the other wing to preserve the balance, and maintain this perilous position until his plane was within a hundred feet of the ground on the French side, the enemy retiring under fire from our anti-airplane guns. At that altitude six of our officers witnessed the sudden collapse of Lieutenant Ward's crippled machine as he fell, and we testify that his death was not caused primarily by wounds inflicted by the enemy, although he was shot in the head and shoulder. But his death, according to our belief, was directly due, beyond question, to the defects in the plane he was flying, parts of which plane by number can be traced to material supplied by Rufus Randall's mills. All the more we regret that several gallant heroes like Lieutenant Ward lost their lives on account of American greed and disloyalty. We, whose names are affixed, solemnly swear that in the best of our belief, Lieutenant Ward lost his life owing to defective parts of his plane, parts manufactured and supplied by the firm of Rufus Randall of Bradford. Here followed the signatures, officially designated, of the officers of Albert's company. Dick looked up from the paper and stared over at Requa. During his absorbed reading, she had sat down on a couch, and her face was buried in a cushion. "'Your father—' Dick had started to say something. He hardly knew what it was himself, under the tremendous shock of the revelation in the paper, when Requa raised her head. "'You understand now why I have not asked you to come here since you left me a week ago. Father confided all that to me before it came out in the paper. It is too horrible to believe.' He says he did not know all about the details of the construction, that much of it was done by men lacking expert knowledge, and he can prove to the government that he was not knowingly guilty. Dick! Requa rose and cried out, as her lover stood stern and unresponsive. You do not know how miserable I am on account of all this. I cannot believe that father meant to do wrong. And yet, Dick said, shrinking back from Requa, as she had a little while before repelled him, the results of the defect work that went out of his mill was just the same as if he was personally responsible. Albert might be living today if— But, oh, Dick, I am not to blame. I am not guilty. Dick turned swiftly, and the next moment he had held out his arm. Requa came to him like a child who was tired, and the next moment Rufus Randall walked into the room. During his entire war experience, Richard Ward, like thousands of other young Americans, had come to have a loathing of the fearful things the enemy had done to beautiful France. Devastated gardens and orchards and parks, bombed hospitals, tortured women and children, ruined cathedrals, blotted out landscapes. The whole thing sank like a blistering memory on his heart. And yet all through he had honestly tried to keep from hating. And now the sight of Rufus Randall affected Richard Ward along the line of least resistance and he was tortured in soul over his loathing of what this man had permitted through his greed for profits, and his resistance to the appealing of personal antagonism he had for him. Randall stared at him as if not sure of his presence. "'What are you doing here?' he asked, speaking slowly. "'I came to comfort Requa for this,' Dick said, looking at the paper his hand still held. "'Lies! I can prove my innocence to the government! Do you think I would purposefully—' 
"'I'm not here to judge you,' Dick cried suddenly. Then he looked at Requa. She had fainted. He carried her over to the couch and laid her down. Randall went out into the hall and called his servant, and Dick waited only a few moments of embarrassing uneasiness on Requa's account. When he went out into the hall, Randall followed him. Dick noted now, as he had not at first, the look on Randall's face betraying the burden he was carrying. "'Tell your father I would like to see him, will you?' Randall spoke with difficulty. "'Tell him yourself.' "'And I will!' Randall flared up with a white heat of sudden passion. He had picked up the copy of the journal which Dick had dropped when Rocco fainted, and he now tore it apart with his big hands and stepped on the pieces as he followed Dick to the door. Dick did not even turn around as he went out. It seemed to him he would choke if he tried to speak. He heard the door shut heavily behind him and went on down the walk. As he came out to the street, three or four men in the group still standing about the way came over to ask him about Randall. "'How's he taking it?' Bert Chandler's father was one of the men who asked. Dick answered in general terms. "'Hangin's too good for him,' another man said. The group formed about Dick as he tried to move along. He was annoyed and angered by the interruption, at a time when he was excited over his own feeling. "'When will the government arrest Randall?' asked one. "'He will give more bail and keep out of jail, all right,' said another. Dick managed finally to escape and start for home. He dreaded the meeting with his father, and he could not help wondering what the result of the meeting would be if Randall and his father should come together. But he had forgotten momentarily one thing among a multitude that the war had done for the folks at home. For months, the people in America had been living daily, almost hourly, in the atmosphere of great events. Shock had succeeded shock. Sensations had become commonplace. Death and destruction were everyday occurrences. People's hearts and minds were not capable of responding to all these events in proportion to their magnitude. There were too many of them. And there is a merciful limit to what the heart can endure or the mind entertained. So Dick, if he had better understood all this, might have been prepared for the sight of his father calmly going over the newspaper details of Randall's case as the government commission had given it out to the public. The evidence against Randall was so overwhelming and so conclusive that any possibility of a mistake was out of the question. Randall was simply whistling in the dark when he said he could prove his innocence. For days he had been living a death in life. The fear that had gripped him had forced a confession from him with Requa a week before the final result was made public. All this, John Ward must have grasped as he read the account given out sensationally that evening. He sat in his study confronting Dick, who had come in somewhat nervously. "'You know all about it, Dad?' "'Yes, Dick, it's dreadful. But it's no more dreadful than a hundred other things we have lived to bear during these past years. And do you know, I find myself thinking almost more of what is going to happen to Randall and Requa than of any effect on ourselves.' Something like a wave of relief swept over Dick. "'Oh, Dad, you can think of Requa, even now, can't you? "'She is not to blame. She is not to blame.' "'No, lad, she is not to blame. "'But the innocent always suffer both the guilty, only in a different way.' "'And Mr. Randall said he was going to see you. "'Will they let him? Will you see him?' "'He will not be formally apprehended before tomorrow, "'but he will be free to come any time before then. "'Yes, I will see him. "'But, Requa, you cannot press the point of her going with you now.' "'No, Dad,' Dick said slowly. "'Her father has a claim. I don't deny that.' "'And is your own purpose unchanged? "'Even if Hindley Requa should make her choice to say, will you go?' "'It was a direct question, a characteristic ward, point-blank question from father to son, "'and Dick, although used to that sort of frankness ever since he was a child, "'shrank a little and hesitated before he answered. "'Yes, I will go, even if I have to go alone.' "'But, oh, Dad, after all these years, without home and love and—' Dick broke down, and his father comforted him as he used to do when Dick was a little boy. But it was the greatest proof he could have of the entire consecration of Dick to his call, that it sounded louder to him than even his natural craving for all that Requa meant to him. It startled Dr. Ward tremendously. After Dick had gone up to his own room, his father dropped the paper, which contained the dramatic account of Albert's death and as if that incident had affected him only for a moment, he let his mind dwell on the living fact of his younger son's consecration to an ideal that measured far more than any earthly ambition for pleasure or personal happiness. How great must have been the world's need of help that Dick had seen on the shattering battle lines of France and Palestine! 
what momentous pressure must lie on his heart now to go into all the world and do his part as he had already gone once the marvel grew as dr ward dwelt upon the astonishing fact a fact that outweighed at every angle the particular and detailed way in which albert had met his death on the field of the world's honour the week that followed rufus randall's tragedy was full of events that made fast and important history on the technicality allowed him he secured further bail pending final decision owing to the government's decision to proceed deliberately with this special case which was attracting widespread attention no immediate return was handed down the bradford citizens were divided in sentiment owing to randall's long standing as a philanthropist but the great majority were clamouring for his imprisonment and still he did not fulfil his threat made to dick and come to see dr ward and the days spread by to another sunday filled with the spirit's power even more than on the days which had already been marked even dr ward with all his optimism and faith in what had already been made manifest was moved to the depths of that day's results news which every one had received of the open call for mexico and asia and africa and the government call for expert architects farmers and business men to heal the gigantic war wounds of the world stirred the entire country the president's proclamation for volunteers along these lines sounded on the hearts and minds of bradford ambulance number no. two forty one like a new call to the colours and at the close of that memorable day a gathering larger than the parsonage could comfortably contain waited for conference and prayer End of chapter 8The very air was permeated with forces that held their tongues in silence, or bid them say few words. Tears were on the cheeks, voices were subdued, silence eloquent. And when the group dispersed it was in silence, as Dr. Ward, his eyes glistening and his heart sobbing for wonder, bade them good night. Early Monday morning, a long-distance call from Bayview came from Chaplain Hunter, begging another talk with Dr. Ward and before noon hunter was in the familiar study voice and gesture and thought on fire with the matter that had brought him over during a part of this famous interview famous as after history proved it to be dick and esther and bert chandler were eager and intensely interested visitors there are so many things i don't know where to begin but first of all is bayview itself dr ward here in bradford you have succeeded with a federated church but I come back home from the war to find seven different denominations in my little town, all struggling for an existence. Why, I cannot understand all that, after what we have been through. Do you remember, Bert, that day on the Avenue Wilson, when we had that review of the Allies, and Ambassador Sharp leaned over and called out to our Captain Grant, and called him by his first name? Bert looked over at Dick, and both smiled at the memory of that great day. Do I? said Bert. I thought at first he was addressing me for my whole name is Burton, like Captain Grant's, you know. And I grabbed my tin hat to take it off, and hit Dick, who was at the steering wheel of the old bus, and almost knocked him off his seat. Oh, yes, I remember that day all right. But the thing I remember it for, Dr. Ward, was not the astonishing way ambassadors and dignitaries generally let go of their dignity on account of our complete victory over Germany, but on account of that astounding make-up of that parade in that review. Never in all history of man on earth was there seen such a mingling of the different nations. Of course you read the accounts of it, but no description could really make one see that thing as it really was. The ends of the earth were there. The President of the United States, for the first time in the history of this country, was in another country than his own, the great guest of honor. There on either side of him sat the great ones of war, King George, Queen Mary, Albert of Belgium, President Poincaré of France, King Emmanuel of Italy, the Emperor of Japan, the king of spain and the president of little portugal chiefs from the great indian empire that gave to great britain of her wealthy princes who laid life and fortune down under the folds of the union jack the great military leaders foch the head of all sitting by our president general haig of the british army our own jack persing marshal joffre marshal patain and commanders from all the forces that had combined against the hun 
but the thing of all that impressed me as nothing in the world will ever impress me again until i see the redeemed hosts of all nations in the other world was the sight of the representatives of the earth met together in the name of holy human freedom creeds forgotten race prejudice swept aside the case of centuries wiped out all hearts beating to the one tune of earth's coming brotherhood we stopped at the arc de triomphe and at the new arc de verdun and reversed the parade so that the lines went in opposite directions to give the marching divisions a chance to see one another that was the most thrilling sight the eye of man ever witnessed after a war that measured the world's greatest struggle for peace i can't begin to remember all the different races and people in that world parade but here for instance came the senegalese tirailleurs black men from the french colony at senegal and right behind them a regiment of our own negroes from georgia the three tenth infantry that did such wonderful work and then there were the french alpine chasseurs the blue devils every one in that redoubtable company that came over to us in 1918 wounded and decorated for exceptional gallant service there came the colonial troops from morocco arabs from far stretches of the unknown desert soldiers from annam the french colony of indochina with their top light cats anglo-indian troops that did such wonderful service in mesopotamia and palestine their snowy turbans moving like white seagulls above the blue of their service uniforms in the vision of that parade as it flowed by i see the portuguese troops who stormed the lens side by side with the scottish highlanders the ladies from hell who asked to have their portuguese comrades near them in the parade and close behind them came a polish regiment their long overcoats curiously buttoned back to allow greater freedom in the march each soldier distinguished with his crisp black moustache a decoration not permitted the british tommy or our own yanks i see the troops of little montenegro the smallest of the allied nations marked for their round service caps and gay insignia behind them came the greeks with their zouave headdress with its flowing fez and snow-white petits and no one will forget the men of italy's crack corps who came swinging along with an alpine stride the bersaglieri who made the record of the fastest forced marches against the Austrians in the campaign along the Piave. In some miraculous manner, which no one has ever been able to explain, these sons of Italy managed to secure and wear, as the distinguishing badge of their service, a plume of cock's feathers, and I never saw one bedraggled or torn or dirty. You would swear a new rooster gave of his best and most lustrous tail feathers every day to each of these men. Behind these men of Italy was a company of New Zealand Maoris. The native children of that colony of Great Britain, whose ancestors less than a century ago were cannibals, but who now worship in churches where Jesus is loved and honored. And near them, the men of Australia and New Zealand, who captured all the German possessions in the Pacific, and hauled down the German imperial banner, and ran up the Union Jack, and saw the natives dance for joy to be relieved from the tyranny of the German officers. I see a regiment of Australians, and another of Canadians, the French Poilu and the British Tommy, and close to them, in panoramic vision of my memory, a company of American Indians, representing twenty-four distinct tribes, graduates of our own government schools, the men of Iceland and the Shetland Islands, and two crack regiments of Irish nearby, followed by a company of Boers and Zulus, and from the very interior of Africa a company of Basutu warriors, who had offered themselves to Great Britain, and walked three thousand miles to Natal to enlist. And then, with all the rest, our own boys from the forty-eight states, boys representing every mingling race of the people who have been coming over to be a part of our national life. Norwegians, Swedes, Danes, Hollanders, Bulgarians, one whole company of Armenians, Bohemians, Austrians, many Germans, full lovers of America, fighting to free the unborn in Germany from the autocracy they themselves hated, Alaskan Aleuts and Siwashes, and even one group of Greenlanders, including 100 Eskimos, marching side by side with Russian Jews, Tartars, cossacks lithuanians belgians serbs men from the north of siberia and one tribe of poisoned arrow blowers from this island of andaman where in all the history of the world could such a sight be duplicated and to crown it all with the christian mark of by this sign we conquer came the marching hosts of the y m c a the red cross and the hospital divisions and my memory stirs again as I see the soldiers from all the nations as they come in the reversal march to pass by these white-clad Red Cross nurses and doctors and these secretaries of the YMCA with the modest red triangle on the sleeve. They had roared out their national cheers before that unparalleled group of high and mighty ones, kings, presidents, and war generals. But when they came in sight of the Red Cross and the YMCA and hospital corps, every soldier hat came off. Cheers died on their lips. Sobs choked their throats. Tears coursed down their cheeks. 
men broke their ranks to run over and kiss the hands of tear-glorified faces of nurses and doctors, and the parade really broke up at that point. I can remember groups of men on their knees, their hands clasped, their lips murmuring prayers in all languages, from the forests of Africa to the mountains of northern India, invoking blessing on the Young Men's Christian Association and the Red Cross, two organizations without a sectarian name, ministering to a world need in the name of a world redeemer, whose last great prayer was that his disciples might be one. And in the face of that stupendous spectacle of that review in France, I come home to my own country and my own people to find in my little town seven denominational bodies living their religious life apart, each struggling to support a minister and maintain a service which is so poorly supported that it has little power to attract and hold men, who have seen the brotherhood of men illustrated on the gigantic scale of service, where men have not only sung and prayed and eaten together, but where they have died in the same trench and have been buried in the same grave, where the resurrection can find both, though one was a Christian and the other Mohammedan, one born in the Himalayas and the other on the prairies of Kansas. Dr. Ward, I cannot settle down to that sort of life. It would not be life. And I have been looking into the missionary giving of my own church, I mean my own denominational body. And these are some humiliating facts I have found. In the last year, the weekly average gift per member for our great missionary causes was only three and seven tenth cents. One thousand four hundred and seventy churches gave less than one cent a week per member to missionary work, and nine hundred and sixty four churches gave nothing except to themselves. On top of all that, Dr. Ward, just think of things like these. By this time, Hunter was on his feet, pacing the little study, arms going, eyes blazing, pausing now and then to emphasize his remarks by smiting Dick or Bert on the shoulder as he passed them. Think of this. The fourth Liberty Loan, you remember, was for six billion dollars, and the fifth for more. And in between, those consolidated drives of the United War Work Campaign, YMCA, YWCA, KFC, War Camp Community Fund, Salvation Army, American Library Association, and Jewish Welfare Board, for 170,500,000. And the amount asked was not only given, but exceeded in every case. Compare with that our pitiful sum of $1,321,977 raised last year for the reconstruction of the world. In other words, seven-eighths of our churches fell below five cents a week per member in contributing to a cause which is enlisting right now the best of our manhood and womanhood. And the failure is due to sectarianism. Just think of what happened to the Allies before we were united under the leadership of General Foch. But from the hour when President Wilson and Lloyd George insisted on concentration and union of forces under one leader, we began to beat German solidarity. That was the beginning of the end. We shall never win any great victories in this Reconstruction Drive until we are really a united body as a living church. And I am frank to say, Dr. Ward, that I do not feel like wasting my time and strength over a sectarian effort in Bayview. The horizon is too narrow. We have made some progress while you have been gone. We have organized our United American Missionary College, and we have consolidated some of our sectarian boards, said Dr. Ward, who had listened to Hunter with deepest interest, as had Esther and Bert and Dick. I know, I know. I'm beginning to find out gradually some of the wonderful things you folks at home did to help win the war. And I hope I am not so foolish or cruel in my criticisms of conditions as I find them in my own town, as to find fault because you have not done more. But you cannot blame me for not feeling willing to stay on in Bayview and face an apparently hopeless situation. Oh, we had a wonderful day yesterday. Over one hundred more volunteers came in response to the call. The whole thing is bewildering. But what can we do with all this human material if we don't have the unity of action and the vast financial support to back it up? Bert spoke up in his slow, hesitating fashion. Chaplain? Why don't you go out on a crusade for the union of the Protestant forces of America? Give that little spiel you just gave us about that parade up the Avenue Wilson with a few rhetorical bombs that'll gas the denominations into unity of feeling. Dr. Ward started up, and the chaplain stopped in his tracks. Just the thing, Dr. Ward cried out, as excited as a young man just seeing a great career open for himself. The denominations are ready for that sort of challenge all over America. We have already agreed on a sensible division of our missionary forces. It's only a beginning, I know, but it's the opening of a new door to the world. Now all we need is a living voice to come along and focus all the longing for unity that exists, even in Bayview, and yours is the voice to do it, Hunter. You have come to the kingdom for such a time as this. There are scores, yes, hundreds of towns like Bradford that have organized federated churches. It is not an untried experiment. 
you can go over this country and give the practical illustrations of the feasibility of church union it worked here it will work in bayview and it must work all over the united states or we cannot win the world for christ hunter stood still in the spot where he had paused at dr ward's first exclamation the group in the study watched him eagerly sometimes the most compelling issues of a man's life are focused into a single moment of decision such a moment had come to chaplain hunter it was not two minutes after dr ward had suggested his course that hunter was saying i'll do it it is a crusade worth a life and of course you can have this powerful support and backing of the federal council of the churches of america dr ward said as quietly as if hunter's decision were a commonplace matter of fact not needing to be discussed hunter was not unduly excited over this conference he stayed to dinner and afterward with dr ward in the little study went over many details that were afterward worked out his boundless enthusiasm his absolute conviction as to the need of the crusade his power to express the common need of unity all fused into a white heat of expression and practical doing and when he finally took his leave dr ward exclaimed in the fullness of his feeling hunter the baptism of the spirit is upon you go in the greatness of that power and nothing can defeat you it was late in the afternoon of this memorable monday when dick came down from his room and stepped out on the porch to go down to the street on an errand the evening journal lay there where the carrier had thrown it and the big headline stared up at him as he pulled the paper open and read rufus randall's appeal denied sentence of ten years in federal prison must be carried out the president alone has power to set aside final sentence very doubtful if he will act dick caught other sentences sake of example severe punishment others implicated he stepped back into the house and went into the study with the paper his father was finishing some notes he and hunter had been going over he took the paper and read the account of randall's fate dick sitting there white-lipped and miserable the president will never interfere will he father no the country clamors for an example and it has one in randall at the supper table randall's case was subject to family discussion with the usual ward frankness even dick's relations to requa were a part of the problem raised by randall's trouble and mr ward and esther and bert who was present all expressed their open sympathy but no one could express what the whole affair meant to dick more than to any one else in the circle late that night afterward dr ward remembered hearing the town hall clock strike ten just as the doorbell rang he went to the door in answer to the summons mrs ward and esther were upstairs dick had gone out to meet with bert and others of company two forty one to talk over plans and dr ward was alone downstairs it was rufus randall dr ward asked him into the study and shut the door randall seemed to be out of breath as if he had been running dr ward quietly sat in his accustomed seat at his desk waiting for randall to speak what he said was so remarkable that dr ward at first did not grasp his whole meaning dr ward i have come to ask if you would go to the president and ask him to pardon me will you randall was leaning forward one big hand on his knee and the other gripping the arm of the chair his heavy face was moist with sweat and he eyed dr ward with a fearful look as he waited for his answer as dr ward did not reply at once to randall's remarkable request he put it again i know it must seem like a ridiculous thing to ask but i can't go to prison really dr ward i don't feel personally responsible for albert's death you know well enough i couldn't foresee that he still dr ward did not say anything and randall his face distorted and pleading his whole body trembling with a torment of fear stammered you do understand me don't you doctor i couldn't come to you with a request like this if i was guilty how could i know that defective parts of planes would go into machine that albert would fly it is monstrous to believe it and yet you know that the defective parts were not the work of german operatives and that you allowed defective material to be used because it was cheaper and more easily obtained dr ward at last replied and for a moment he felt the righteous wrath of one of the old prophets confronting a concrete wrong not simply a wrong that had touched his own life in a painful way but a wrong that put dishonor on the name of patriotism and made it harder to live for every citizen but i could not supervise or superintend all the machines that were made why doesn't the government arrest and condemn the foremen and the workers who really did the work randall was so pitiful in his childish attempts to excuse his own greed that dr ward found himself feeling a sort of contempt for his appearance his big form was doubled up in the chair and his face was discolored with passion fear shame but not remorse guilt 
self-pity and rage all striving in the man's stricken soul for expression. Ward could not recall when a more pitiable creature had been in his study, and in the course of the years a large number of people had sat there, unburdening their souls, and seeking advice or consolation. But this man was seeking neither. He was after his own welfare, as he had always been. The study door opened, and Mrs. Ward made a step into the room. She saw and recognized Randall, and as he started to rise, she exclaimed, "'You here, Rufus Randall!' Then to her husband she said, "'John, I thought you were alone. I came in to get Albert's picture. Esther and I want to make a better frame for it.' She went up to the doctor's desk and took the picture with the framed letter beside it and started to go out. She was so close to Randall that as he stumblingly rose, he brushed against her. Mrs. Ward recoiled from him as if he were some unclean creature, for suddenly it seemed to sweep over her all at once that this man was the direct or indirect cause of her first-born son's death. If it had not been for the defective material used in the airplane which had come out of Rufus Randall's mills, Albert might even now be alive, and she had loved her first-born with a devotion and passion which was equaled only by her husband's unspoken affection for Richard. Mrs. Ward's manner affected Rufus Randall curiously. His mind seemed suddenly to turn irritably to the days before the war, when many people were discussing the sacrifices of their sons more than their service for freedom's sake. And he spoke in his embarrassment hardly conscious of the effects his words might have on the heart of this constantly mourning mother. "'Madame, you did not have to give your son. He might have remained at home if you—' "'Stop!' Mrs. Ward spoke sharply and then, as if moved by a sudden recollection of the boy's voluntary enlistment before he was drafted, she said softly, quoting the poet's lines, "'God gave my son to trust to me. Christ died for him, and he should be. A man for Christ, he is his own, and God's and man's, not mine alone. He was not mine to give. He gave himself that he might help to save. All that a Christian might revere, all that enlightened men hold dear.' It matters not where some men live, if my dear son his life must give. Hosannas I will sing for him, e'en though my eyes with tears be dim. And now the war is over, now his gallant comrades home again. I'll cheer them as they're marching by, rejoicing that they did not die. And when his vacant place I see, my heart will bound with joy that he was mine so long, my fair young son, and cheer for him whose work is done." She did not speak another word to Randall, who had shrunk from her, and she was going out of the study when Dr. Ward said, "'Sarah, Mr. Randall has come to ask me to beg the President to pardon him. What shall we do with his request?' "'What? You come to ask that of us?' "'Yes, Mrs. Ward,' Randall spoke doggedly. "'I cannot go to prison. I cannot.' "'Better men than you have gone,' Mrs. Ward said, with unwanted bitterness." The next moment she had walked over to the side of her husband. "'Oh, John, do not ask me to answer. I trust your wisdom and mercy. I am not equal to this. Let me go and pray for the strength I lack.' Like a girl wife, as she had when a bride, she laid her head on the doctor's breast and sobbed, holding the boy's picture close, and for a few moments her cry was the only sound in the little room. Then she went out, and Rufus Randall breathed heavily as she closed the door. End of chapter 9
and before Dr. Ward could rise from his desk, fell face forward on the floor. The noise of his fall was heard by Mrs. Ward and Esther. They came running downstairs and into the study, just as Dr. Ward was trying to raise Randall up. When the physician came in answer to the instant summons, he declared it to be a stroke, and Requa was sent for. Dick came in a few minutes after she arrived. It was a circle of pale faces that looked at one another about the bed where Randall had been laid, as they waited for the doctor's verdict. He may recover, probably will, only to receive another stroke later. No one can tell when. The wisdom of all the medical authorities cannot say more, was the doctor's final word. Meanwhile, if he can be kept quietly here. His place is here, Requa. Mrs. Ward had her arm about the girl, and both were sobbing. Requa was at first terrified, but with unexpected steadiness, in the days that followed, she proved an efficient and cheerful nurse. And on the day her father was able to be removed to his own home, he followed her every movement with deep and apparently sincere affection. They were alone that morning, and arrangements had been made to have a car at the house by the middle of the afternoon. Randall could speak with some difficulty, and was gradually gaining control of the lower part of his body, so that the doctor gave him hope of even walking again. He called Requa up close and whispered to her, "'Ask Dr. Ward to come in. I want to see him alone.' When Dr. Ward came in, Randall motioned him to come up close to the bed after Requa had gone out. He spoke thickly, but Dr. Ward could understand. "'Does the doctor think I will get well?' Ward hesitated, but finally he said, he does not know all the possibilities. He says you may be able to walk again. I can feel all right in my legs, Randall spoke with pitiful eagerness. Then with a whimper, I don't want to die, Dr. Ward. You may live a long time, Ward said, and waited for any sign of remorse of repentance. But the only emotion in the stricken life that lay there was fear, and Ward went on, I have written to the President and had his reply. Randall raised himself up in bed and clutched the bedclothes. "'He will pardon me! He will now, won't he?' "'I have his reply,' Ward said gravely. "'And he says that he cannot grant a pardon, much as he regrets the refusal. "'But the interests of the public demand your punishment.' Randall fell back. "'I am no more guilty than others! Others!' He spoke so thickly the Dr. Ward could not distinguish his words. He sat by his side, praying for a sign of repentance or softening of spirit. Randall gave no intimation of any such feeling, and when he was taken home that afternoon, he expressed nothing except a broken word of thanks for the ward's kindness to him. Within two weeks' time, he was walking feebly about his room in his own house, when a federal official came to convey him to the federal prison. Requa was overwhelmed. She had thought that under the conditions her father might be allowed to remain at home. The official was polite and gentlemanly, but he was acting under orders and showed her his papers. Requa was alone. She went to the telephone and called up Dr. Ward, who replied that he would come right over, and while the official waited she tremblingly went into her father's room and told him. To her surprise he took the news quietly, and even insisted on going out at once to see the officer. He walked haltingly into the room, and after looking over the papers simply said, "'I'm ready to go any time.' I don't think I shall be an expense to the government very long. "'You can have what time you need to adjust your affairs,' said the officer. Requa was standing by her father, who had taken a seat in front of the officers. She suddenly fell down on her knees by Randall, and cried out, "'Oh, father, I am going with you. They will let me live in the town. I shall be allowed to see him, won't I?' She turned to the officer. "'Certainly you can do that. Very many relatives of, of inmates are near the prison.' "'You hear that, father? I'm going to be near you.' Randall drew his daughter's head to him, and two great tears rolled over his cheeks, while his lip trembles. They were sitting thus, the official in considerable embarrassment, when Dr. Ward and Dick were ushered in. Dick had been at home when Requa's message came, and could not bear to think of his father going over alone. They were both amazed to note the way in which Randall and Requa had received the summons. And after talking over the situation, Requa assented to the plan that Dr. Ward proposed, that she should come and stay with them until her father had been received into the prison, and Mrs. Ward had had time to go with her, and find suitable rooms for her in the town. Randall expressed himself as ready to go at any time. "'They won't have to keep me long,' 
he said to Dr. Ward. I'll not be a great expense. Dr. Ward tried to say the right word. If there had been the slightest hint on Randall's part of willingness to acknowledge his guilt, or even any softening of his heart in view of his punishment, Ward could have been a comfort to him. But the only sign Randall gave that night when he left the house, with the officer, was his emotion as he parted from Wekwa. She had borne the strain of the whole terrible experience with astonishing courage, and did not break down until the last moment, after her father had left the house. Then she turned to Mrs. Ward, who had come over with Dick to help in any way they could, and Mrs. Ward consoled her like a real mother. Not even Dick could take her place, but that evening, when the family had all gathered together, Requa had said to Dick simply, "'Dear, you don't see any other way from me, do you? My place is over there near father. What else could I do?' Nothing, said Dick, choking. I don't understand how you bear it. You are the bravest girl. I'm doing it for him and for you, said Requa proudly. But, oh, Dick, after all these years, I want to be with you, to go with you anywhere. Dick, anywhere in all the world. Sometime, maybe, was all poor Dick could manage to say. Two days later, Mrs. Ward and Requa went over and secured suitable rooms in the town. Requa, with the fortitude that amazed Mrs. Ward, calmly laid out a campaign of regular study for herself. "'Dick is preparing himself to go to Palestine or Syria. I'm going to read up on the country and the people, and keep posted on all movements over there. I must do something regular, or I'll go an insane up here. Dick and I will write often, and I'll live and work for him and for Daddy.' She gave Mrs. Ward every assurance of her serious purpose, and when Dick received the account on his mother's return, he felt almost hopeful of some happy future for himself, as he resolutely set himself to the task of preparation for his missionary service. And the task to which Dick now gave himself up, with all the earnestness born of intense human sorrow and inward obedience to his divine call, was a task worthy of the best and greatest powers he possessed. What was true of him was true of all the others who had made their definite choice to go into all the world for its redemption. They were astonished, these heroes of the battlefields of Europe, to find that the work of redeeming the world called for as much skill, as much genius, as much energy and power, as the work of organizing armies and planning military campaigns. Once started on a study of their respective fields of service at the American Missionary College, they never ceased to exclaim over the boundless sweep of the commission. It called for physical endurance equal to the soldiers at his best, for a knowledge of history, language, agriculture, music, sciences, and a depth of religious fervor and spiritual faith and love of mankind that taxed to its fullest capacity their bodies, souls, and intellects. One day Bert said, after a preliminary outline of Mexico's missionary campaign had been sent to him by the college department, I don't believe I can get into this draft, Esther. The requirements are too many. I can't measure up to them. In order to be a missionary to Mexico, I ought to be a statesman, a diplomat, a linguist, a surgeon and physician, an agriculturalist, an editor, a financer, and a full-grown saint. That is because a missionary is really the biggest person in all the world, because making disciples of all nations is the biggest business ever committed to humans, said Esther. There is this thought to encourage us. We shall probably know a good deal more than the people to whom we go. Well, I'm ready to start any time I'm reasonably fit, and I somehow have the feeling that we shall find Alamero's family. Wouldn't it be a great adventure if we should? If we don't find his family, we shall find many others just as needy, Esther replied, and with boundless enthusiasm, much of which she imparted to the slower-minded Bert, the girl plunged into daily study of the Great Commission on its meaning. Time flies fast in work and in doing the Master's bidding. Dr. Ward was astounded as the days swept along and new recruits were constantly added to the list of those who wanted to enlist in this army. These newcomers were not the results of any special efforts on his own part, but seemed to be the outcome of a wave of missionary passion sweeping through the churches. Hunter telegraphed from a small town where he had gone on his crusade of federating churches. Seventy-five young men and women enlisted here last night at close of our meeting, ready to take oath of allegiance to the Master and to go into all the world. Some of them already members of the Students' Volunteer Band. Churches here unite in federation like the one at Waterbury, Vermont, where the Methodist and Congregationalist churches have federated. Wonderful experiences. The movement for federation is gaining power. 
This was only a modest hint of the real facts. Chaplain Hunter was moving through the States in a crusade which was marked by intense spiritual reality. His name and his purpose were known all over America. The response to his glowing appeal for federation was seemingly miraculous. Town after town called for him to come and unite the divided forces of denominationalism. Midweek services for mutual conference, prayer and consecration were held in hundreds of towns in every state. The problem of the Sunday night church service was being solved, not by special individual efforts to attract audiences, but by a real union of four or five or eight or ten different churches coming together. A new and refreshing phase of Christianity was being created by Hunter and his fiery but sensible consecration, and the denominations were making a new chapter in the history of the church. A few weeks after the tragedy of Rufus Randall and his consignment to the federal prison, Esther and Bert were married at the parsonage and went direct to the American Missionary College to prepare themselves for their mission to Mexico. Richard followed a month later with a group from the old ambulance company. Dr. Ward was musing over this list one Sunday night after his services were over. Mrs. Ward was with him in the study. "'It's marvelous, Sarah, when you stop to think of it, this thing. More bewildering than the calls of the colors that came suddenly in 1917. Think of this. Robert Underwood is going to North China, Connie Clayton to Bulgaria, George Ryder to Turkey, Wallace Holmes to South America, Roger Blake to Italy, Clarence Wood to East Africa, his brother Will to South China, and our own Bert to Mexico.' I have to rub my eyes, especially when I think of Dick going off alone to Palestine. It took more courage for the lad to answer this call than the other. I don't understand. He left us with a smile each time, and to think of Requa up there with her father. Dick is surely a wonder, Mrs. Ward said as she wiped away a tear. I don't see how we could stand all this being alone, John, if these young folks didn't shame us with their heroism. Randall may linger on for a long time, Dr. Ward said. Requa writes that he has apparently resigned to his fate and is well enough to do some clerical work in the prison office, and Dick never questioned Requa's duty to her father. But if her father should pass away there soon, she will certainly join Dick. No doubt of that, replied Dr. Ward cheerfully, and it is that thought which gives Dick hope. But there's the bell. I'll answer it. He went to the door and returned with Archie Nelson, who had been one of the heroes at Chateau Thierry. Nelson had no home when he enlisted and was settling down in Bradford as an expert electrician, specially skilled in battery work. He was not married and did not seem to care for a home. An odd genius, clean-minded, generous, a lover of little children, he had adopted two French orphan lads and had sent for them to come and live with him. But during decisions of his comrades to go into all the world, he had made no sign that he was specially interested in the radical step the other boys were taking. He seemed embarrassed as Dr. Ward ushered him into the study. Mrs. Ward rose to go out. "'Won't you stay, Mrs. Ward? I want your advice, too, as well as Dr. Ward's.' Mrs. Ward sat down, and Nelson looked and acted nervous, as if not quite certain how what he had to say would be received. "'I felt ever since the fellows went away to the missionary training camp as if I was a slacker, Dr. Ward, and I can't rest until I get your OK on my plan. As I understand it, your phrase, all the world, covers every spot on the globe, doesn't it?' By all means, not a spot left out. Then Bradford is a part of all the world? It certainly is. Where else could it be? Then, if I enlist in the draft to serve here in Bradford, can I be counted in with Dick and Bert and Underwood and the rest? Archie spoke so wistfully that Dr. Ward, looking at him and remembering his heroic record over there, was near to tears. My dear fellow, this is just what the Great Commission means. We can't all go to Palestine or India or Turkey. If you can make disciples anywhere, you are called to the colors anywhere. That was in my mind, Archie said with a sigh of relief. You see, I know my limitations, and I know I could never make good in a mission field. But I've noticed since I began my work down around the shops a raft of boys running the streets. Many of them lost their daddies or their big brothers in the war, and they've been neglected. And I wondered if I might carry on as scoutmaster in Bradford. There's no Boy Scouts organization here, and I would be able to give my whole time outside the shop to the boys, and maybe that would be counted a sort of missionary service, and I would get some honorable mention as belonging to the other volunteers. Mrs. Ward anticipated her husband. There, the dream of my thought is coming true. Mr. Nelson, I have tried to get a dozen different men in Bradford to organize the Boy Scouts. Different ones have tried and failed. It's not the fault of the boys, but no leader has been found. You are just the one. Why didn't we think of you sooner? 
Dr. Ward went over and shook Nelson's hand, and then in his excitement he paced up and down the little strip of worn rug that ran like a path by his desk. "'Nelson, all this makes me think of an incident that happened years ago in South Dakota. I was in a home missionary church there, and it was receiving aid from a home missionary society. A seminary classmate of mine had gone to Central Turkey as a missionary, and had built up a self-supporting church. He trained his people to give their money to all good causes, and among others he had a foreign missionary society.' Somehow he heard of my struggling little home missionary church under the Dakota frontier, and told his people of our need, and what did they do but take up a foreign missionary offering for my church in Dakota? So you see what home missionary work is in one part of the world is foreign work in another. Bradford is foreign missionary ground to the people in Palestine. You are just as much going into all the world if you evangelize these boys here, as if you went to Jerusalem or Peking. Nelson went out of that conference with a fiery enthusiasm to do his bit in Bradford. His example was contagious. He secured the enthusiastic help of businessmen and other members of Ambulance 241 to clean up Bradford and make it truly missionary ground. And it is part of the history of the whole wonderful movement that swept the country that the scoutmaster of Bradford was instrumental in reaching with Christian influence and real evangelism nearly every neglected boy in the town. As the time sped on, Dr. and Mrs. Ward were thrilled by the news that came into the little study from the ends of the earth. The one thing that kept their hearts young and preserved them from intolerable loneliness was these messages telling of the triumphs of the cross and the lands where it was borne by the men and women who were pouring in a constantly increasing army out of America into all the world. Esther and Bert had finished their special course of preparation in the American college within a year and a half and almost before it seemed possible, letters were coming into the parsonage from sunny Sonora, the western province on the Gulf of California. We are at Suharaba, about one hundred miles east of Hermosillo, up in the mountains. Wonderful opportunities. A few months later, we have been transferred to Alamos, south of the River Mayo. Thanks to the generous provision made for this station, the handsome and commodious church and school buildings have already been erected. Our second Sunday at Alamos, we had a crowd of 3,000 present. We are overwhelmed with the prospect. These people are hungering for the gospel. We already have an enrollment of 900 in our Bible school. The church will seat 2,500, but it is not big enough. Next week, Bert, Esther was writing, is going up into the mountains as far as Baroyeka. He thinks there is actually a possibility that Alamero's children are there, from inquiries he has made. It is astonishing how well he talks the language, and the Yaquis almost worship him. He is a wonderful man, my husband, and, and I am in love with him more and more every day. I never dreamed of such happiness, and we both wonder how anyone except missionaries can be perfectly happy. Almost in the same mail came a long letter from Underwood in North China, only a part of which is here given. Underwood and his wife, a Smith College girl who had served in the French building during the war, were tremendously enthusiastic over their work at Ting Cho and Pao Ting Fu. They wrote, There are so many seeking instruction that we are utterly unable to meet the demands. They say that so many desire to enter the church that they haven't time to take down the names. Literally hundreds of villages here have been affected. The men showed me the map of the district, with the various villages where they are Christian, marked in a red circle, and it seems as if almost every village in the Xian had some inquirers. Not only so, but in the city of Ting Chu itself, as a result of this religious movement, the gentry have built a large commodious building, which they dedicated to reform and moral instruction. Another building is an educational bureau center. Both these places are the outgrowth of the religious movement there during the past year. The gentry and the students of the schools are regular attendants at the services. We must not weary you with many, many details, and yet we desire to present it that you pray very earnestly for the Pao Ting Fu field. Pastor Lee of Peking and three other men, one from Tianjin, one from Tungxian, and one from our own Pao Ting Fu, have been making an evangelistic tour of this field. They say they have never seen anything like it, that there is nothing like it in North China, and they favor calling men from other fields and putting them into this field in order to conserve results. Pastor Lee estimated that there are 1,500 people who are really in earnest and who are ready to receive instruction which will lead them to enter the church. At the very time Dr. and Mrs. Ward were reading these letters and feeling stirred to the depths by them, on the edge of the village of Nazareth there emerged from an irrigating ditch down on the southwest slope of the hill a figure that recalled the old mud-covered days in France. It was Dick Ward, 
and his stout engineering suit was plastered with the thick clay of the ditch which he had been measuring to get its proper angle. Busy figures of men dotted the hillside. Modern machinery was working on all sides. A wonderful spring had been discovered under the slope, and the American Relief had been using Dick's skill in a part of his development, and as he himself had said, I did not come out here to stand up under a palm tree and preach long sermons to the natives, clad in a black suit and a white tie. If this water will grow more wheat and make more bread for children in the Esterlon Valley, I guess it's missionary work all right. He sat down on a concrete base and fell to musing on the great life that once lived up there in that little town, now being modernized with electric light and sanitation and health-contained buildings. An electric engine with trolley cars quietly stung around the base of the hill, making its hourly trip to Tiberias. The coaches filled with travelers and merchants and farmers who had come up from Jerusalem on the morning train. He was so used to the sight that he did not feel the amazement older men might, who had seen Palestine under Turkish misrule. But the whole thing, including the meaning of the busy scene all around him, did have its impression. It was good to live in the midst of it and be a part of the actual restoration of the promised land to God's people, to the chosen peculiar people of Bible times. Someone called his name, and he came back to his immediate surroundings as one of the engineers brought up with a cable gram. Burke asked me to bring it over, just came in from the wireless at Beirut. Dick quickly opened it with a prayer that it might not be bad news of illness at home, and stood there, his hat off, the rays of the setting sun over the slope where Jesus used to sit, falling over his still boyish face. Father passed away last night. Your father was with me. I am coming out with the next company of Red Cross nurses and missionaries. Requa. Dick's lips touched the little slip of paper. Then he went up the hill to a quiet spot and kneeled. The sunshine was just falling behind the shadow. But it was summer in his heart as he kneeled there, maybe very close to the spot where his master used to go at twilight to commune with his heavenly father. End of chapter 10 Recording by Adele de Pinaroles. Chapter 11 of All the World by Charles Monroe Sheldon This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Adele de Pinaroles. Chapter 11 Chaplain Willis Hunter had just come in from one of his great crusades for Federation of the Churches, and was taking dinner with Dr. and Mrs. Ward on his way to another campaign, covering a dozen states and over fifty cities and towns. After dinner he went into the study. "'I've had the time of my life,' it goes without saying. Town after town has come into the Federated plan. Denominationalism as such has lost its hold. The imagination of the present-day Christian is fired by the thought of the one leadership.' See what we gained by federating our forces at the village of Colfax, Union of a Baptist and Presbyterian Church. 1. Federation saves paying two pastors and keep, keeping two church buildings when one is sufficient. It makes the public more willing to aid. 2. The congregation being more than doubled, there is more enthusiasm and will to work. 3. It has silenced the criticism that churches are competing instead of cooperating. 4. The economic and fraternal features of Federation appeal to the public and bring into line people who did not patronize either church before. The new plan has met a real need in the community and the people respond accordingly. We combine the leadership to the advantage of both the church and the community. Since the Federation of the two churches, the Union Church has been the dynamic center of the village and has been the leader in all movements for community betterment. This is a well-known fact in the community. From Federal Council Report and look here, Brother Ward, Hunter went on, with boundless enthusiasm. On to this last campaign, the Committee on the United Church of the United States sent me to my own town of Bayview, with its seven different denominations. You remember the situation there right after the war was so impossible that I did not feel able to go on with my work there. Well, you never saw such a miracle of grace as the one at Bayview. Seven churches, Baptist, Congregational, Methodist, Presbyterian, United Presbyterian, Christian and Lutheran have formed a united body, and the results are even more splendid than we dare to dream. As I said before, there is no difficulty over denominational questions. Two Baptists are as apt to fall out with one another as are a Baptist and an Episcopalian. I have learned this also, that no church has a monopoly of good Christians. There are as many good workers from one as from another. Among our Sunday school teachers are Baptists, Episcopalians, Methodists, Lutherans, Presbyterians, and Congregationalists, and from their work no one could tell which was which. 
Denominational lines seem to be almost entirely forgotten, though there are several who retain connection with their denominational church and help in its support. I think it would be impossible for one to belong to this church for any length of time and retain any denominational prejudice. It is very seldom that one refuses to join the church on the ground that the church is a union church, though we have a few, an increasingly small number, who work on the church but do not join it. If anyone had told me six months ago that a union could actually be made, I would have refused to believe it. Today I see it with my own eyes. More than that, Dr. Ward, Hunter went on, pacing along the strip of worn rug and wearing its path deeper with its energetic stride. The drive for money is coming on far beyond all expectations. Under the Federal Council and the United Missionary Committee of all the denominations we have, as you know, set the amount for the first drive at a hundred million dollars, and it is going over the top with a bound. Look here. Hunter excitedly pulled out a bunch of official documents and opened them on Ward's desk. The tabulated lists of amounts already pledged were over eighty million dollars, and the canvas of the states had only just begun. We can redeem the world now we are united Christendom. There is money enough in the hands of church members alone to do it. All the big businessmen demand is a showing of the need and the results. That last letter you had published from Underwood in North China brought a contribution of a hundred thousand dollars from one man. Dick's letters from Palestine, printed in New York, have netted thousands of dollars. If we can only make the moneyed men of America see this war for Christ as big an issue as the war for human freedom, we shall get all the money we can spend. That is what we must make them see. We must make good all along the line. Our only embarrassment right now is the crowd of volunteers. The American college, as you know, is so full it can't hold another volunteer. You've got to bid colleges and half a dozen centers. And did I tell you? Long and Browning of Washington have promised the money for plans, and the firm of Andrews in Chicago will subscribe half a million to start the first buildings. Oh, it's a great time to live, but I've talked myself out. Give me some letters from the boys out on the field. That's what I want to take with me on this campaign. I don't have to do a thing to get money, but tell the audience what the boys and their wives are doing over there, all over the world. I have one here from Bert that just came in this morning, said Dr. Bird. He and Esther are having a very remarkable experience in the province of Sonora. Let me read the most important part. It reads like the wildest romance. And yet I know there is nothing, not even in war, to equal some of the experiences of the missionaries. He says, Two weeks ago I went up to Barrow Yeka again in search of Alomero's family, and I found his wife and children working in a copper mine at Talatecas. After this, don't tell me anything about fiction being stranger than truth. It couldn't be. I got them out and brought them down to Alamos, and Kadina, that's her name, is working in our house. She makes a wonderful nurse for Albert Richard Chandler, who I need not tell you is the best baby ever born in Mexico. Our congregations continue to overflow our building. The committee is sending us more teachers. We have quite a colony here now, over seven of us, and the whole district is becoming civilized. There is a lot of adventure here. It beats Chateau Thierry a mile. I have to superintend the farm, the hospital just finished, the coffee house, the school, and the printing plant for the young men. It's a man's job, and it looks like it would last as long as I do, for the ignorance and degradation are past belief. But then so is the power of the gospel to transform. I enclose picture of Kadina and Albert Richard. We are a happy family. Bert. And here is one from Underwood's wife. It is part of the tragedy of service in all the world. Robert passed away last Tuesday. The scourge of typhus following the great floods and his enormous labors for the district caught him and two of our best teachers. His body lies in the mission compound burial place, and his pupils bring flowers to it daily. He fell in battle facing forward. And here is a bunch of letters from Turkey and the East. Mohammedanism is beginning to yield to Christianity under the Allied rule in Turkey. The great college on the Bosphorus swarms with Muslim-born students. In the Balkans, Bulgaria is gradually regaining her faith in God, which she lost in her mad scramble to out-German Germany. The mission stations in Romania, Serbia, Albania... Russia, all report marvelous triumphs of the gospel. A new day is dawning for all the world, thanks to united Protestantism and the response of our youth to the greatest adventure of the ages. Three months later, when Hunter had finished his tour, and while he was again in the familiar little study, now famous for its great counsels, Dr. Ward was called to his telephone by long distance. It was Requa. She was calmly saying, Dr. Ward, father has had another stroke. The doctor says it will probably be the last. "'Can you come?' he asked for you. "'And will you bring a flag?' he asked for that. Ward turned to Hunter, giving him the message. Hunter was greatly moved. 
Dr. Ward took up the instrument again. Chaplain Hunter is here in the study. Can you listen to him just a word? Requa gave eager assent. Hunter expressed his deep sympathy and asked if he might come with Dr. Ward. Requa gave a tearful and grateful affirmative, and so at the last moment, there in the prison hospital, two of her best friends stood with her by the side of Rufus Randall as his spirit departed. He had made known to Requa, who understood his slightest motion, that he wanted the flag of his country put on his breast, and as he was not able to move his hands, she placed them over the folds of the banner. With a look on his features that none of them will ever forget, the dying man, by what seemed a last exercise of his old tremendous will, moved his fingers, pressing the flag close up to his body in a gesture that was eloquent of loyalty. He made no other expression. And into the presence of him who alone judges aright the sons of men, Rufus Randall's soul passed, leaving behind at least one faithful being who had given unstintedly of human affection at terrible cost of suffering. Requa was uplifted by the presence of the men who had known her sacrifice and understood it. The body was brought to Bradford. It was a very humble and quiet service that marked the funeral of the richest man in the town. And after it was all over, and the necessary business of Rufus Randall had been attended to, Requa announced her intention to go at once to Palestine to join Dick. Chaplain Hunter had an agreeable surprise for her. He had stayed on in Bradford to perfect plans for another campaign in the Federation Crusade, but a few days after Rufus Randall's death he came into the wards while Requa was there, and read a letter he had just received from the Red Cross headquarters at Washington. They want me to head the new commission going over to superintend the great reclamation works in the Estrelon Valley. It is providential. I have just wired that I will be ready to go at once. There is a special section of trained nurses, agriculturalists, and mechanics going over. Requa, will you go with us? And maybe I may have the honor and pleasure of serving you and Dick over there. Requa did not blush at the thought of her coming marriage to the man whose suffering with hers had deepened the true love they both felt. But a tear of profoundest thanksgiving to a good God fell over her cheek as she turned to Chaplain Hunter with silent gratitude. One month later, Dick was in Jerusalem as the train came in from Jaffa with the Red Cross Commission. Hunter managed to get between the crowd and Dick and Requa when they met, and his big bulk interposed, in the confusion of the unloading and the train, between them and the mob on the platform. Dick said afterward that it was all unnecessary, as he saw no crowd, only a girl who came to him and put her arms round his neck, as if she also was conscious of only one person in Jerusalem or all the world. Next day in the American church they were married, Chaplain Hunter performing the service, a little company of Dick's associates and personal friends present. They had a simple evening meal at the Red Cross headquarters, and then the friends, one after another, went away. Dick said to Requa as they went out, walking through the Via Sacra and out towards the open Stevens Gate, "'Dearest, do you know where I would like to go for our wedding journey before we come back to our room?' "'Wherever it is, dearest Dick, I will go with you anywhere into all the world.' "'Then let us go out to Bethany. Here is the road where he walks so often. I have been out here often, and facing Bethany on that hill over there, perhaps, he parted from his disciples. Shall we go?' They went along the white road hand in hand like two children. And when they had reached the little hill facing Bethany, now restored into a beautiful village, they sat down. There was much for them to say to one another. The troubles and sorrows and experiences through which they had passed had ripened and enriched their lives. The wonderful triumphs of the cross in all lands were in their hearts. The gracious goodness of God was trembling with human happiness, and the hour was precious with coming joy. But as they sat there in the peaceful twilight, they were silent, awed by the presence that seemed to be still living out there, toward Bethany. And as later the electric lights along the white road began to come softly out, reminding them in bewildering thought of the new holy land made so by a Christian America in Great Britain and France, redeeming the desolation of the old Palestine, and making it a land free from violence and cruelty, with the gates of the city not shut at night, the same thought seemed to come to each of them. Requa's head was on Dick's shoulder, his arm, his left arm, around her, as he whispered, "'What would Jesus think of this new Jerusalem, of this transformed Bethany? How would he enjoy to go out to Bethany with his disciples now?' "'He is Dick. He must be seeing all the triumphs of his gospel now, the oneness of his disciples for whom he prayed, the new Palestine which he so dearly loved.' "'I am sure he does,' whispered Dick and his gospel will redeem all nations. 
Over on Calvary, the great cross erected by the Allied nations began to glow. It lifted up its radiance against the sky like a living thing, and Dick and Requa gazed upon it in awed silence. And then in the silence they seemed to hear that voice which once spoke within sound of where they sat, giving out the great commission, which was to construct a new world for the nations. Go ye into all the world, and make disciples of the nations. And, lo, I am with you alway, even unto the end of the ages. The End End of Chapter 11 End of All the World by Charles Monroe Sheldon Thank you for listening.